This full build video has been brought to you by Squarespace. Well, here is something I never thought I'd say. I bought a Hyundai. And the reason I never thought I'd buy one is because they've always been sort of middle of the road cars, which are perfectly fine, but not really particularly exciting. Hyundai's typically seem to be more catered for blasting to the shops than blasting around the Nürburgring or for taking your Westie to the park rather than doing laps around Cadwell Park. That is until now. So most of you probably know this, but this is a Hyundai i30N. N to Hyundai is what AMG is to Mercedes. It's like the performance division. So the Hyundai i30N is supposed to be a platform to rival something kind of like a Golf GTI. Now I'm gonna be real with you. I don't actually know loads about these cars, but from what I've seen already, I quite like it. <laughs> and with good reason, let me tell you exactly why. So from what I can tell, the i30N is trying to capture the essence of hot hatchery, which I think some of us are forgetting about because it's got a manual gearbox, enough power, and a pointy little car, which is a really good combo for blasting around British roads. I'll have to be honest, I was quite happy when I seen this had a manual gearbox. I know they do have an option of an auto. I'm not sure if that's just in the facelift one, but I think that should make it quite fun to drive. It's been a long time since I've driven a front wheel drive manual car with a bit of power anyway. And from what I remember, it was always quite enjoyable. And not that I'm hating on them in any way, shape or form, but a lot of hot hatches these days do seem to go for automatic gearboxes, which does take a little bit away from the driving experience, even though it does make the car faster. And that's why having a manual gearbox for me is quite a nice refreshing change. Now there is more about the car like than just the gearbox because that hot hatch essence seems to be spread throughout it consistently. So the wheels themselves are these 19 inch diamond cut ones, which are all right, but the brakes are quite nice and chunky. I believe they're just single pots, but they look a decent size and they look like they're gonna work well to me. There's also a bunch of really nice styling accessories around the car to give it a bit more aggression, like the diffuser on the back, the spoiler, the side skirts, and well, we'll come back to the front bumper later. Now, one of the things I quite like about this car is the fact it's sort of the underdog, really, because who in their right mind is gonna go and buy a brand new Hyundai when you've got the alternatives out there from VW and BMW? Uh, why would you go and pick this? But I think Hyundai knew this when they were building it because they've really spec this car out well in order to compete with the German manufacturers. So on mine, for example, we've got heated seats, heated steering wheel, parking sensors. We've got lane assist, different driving modes that are available on the steering wheel. This uh, Apple CarPlay head unit from factory up here. So there's plenty of tech inside it. And also underneath the bonnet, well, more specifically inside the gearbox, there is a limited slip differential as well, which on these front wheel drive, higher powered cars does make them a lot more fun to drive and a lot faster. So to be straight with you, I'm actually really looking forward to driving this car to see what makes it so highly reviewed and actually be competitive against the German market. So now let's talk engine. There is two variants of the i30N. There is a normal one, which comes with a two litre turbocharged engine with about 250 horsepower. And then there's the performance pack, which is this one, which I think has about 280 horsepower, which yeah, it's a reasonable difference. And speaking of differences, why don't you look at transforming your business by building a website using Squarespace. From SEO to e-commerce, marketing tools to analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform that's got you covered. Using Squarespace's pre-designed templates, you can simply and easily build yourself a state-of-the-art website. So whether you're like me and you're selling yourself or you're trying to sell a product for your business, Squarespace really does have everything you're gonna need. From custom images, videos, and text and links, you can add everything that you'll want on your website. And then once you've finished designing your website, Squarespace can even help you improve it too with its online tools. So to build your dream website, go on to squarespace.com today using my link in the description and discount code SLICKS to save yourself some money off your first website or domain name. So thank you Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Let's get on with this full build. Now supposedly out the box, the i30N actually sounds pretty good, but there's one main reason why I can't start it. And that is because it's got no keys. And that's a big problem. So we had Mark Nip Brown from Premium Bespoke Auto Works, and he's gonna sort that key situation for us. What have we had to do, Mark? Um, for a start, we'd have to get the pin and the, uh, the cut code for the keys. Yep. So now we've got key for opening the emergency door, Easy emergency that. lock even, yeah? Easy as that. <laughs> cut that. We've opened the door. Now we're into programming the keys to it. We've got the proper i30N keys. You can only use these i30 keys. So you can't have so, fake keys? No. Genuine only? Uh, genuine from uh, from Hyundai. So I've already gone through the program procedure. I've got one more press to do, um, and then we should have ignition, and then Chris, I'll leave it to you to uh, start it up. So. Yeah. 
So as quick as a flash, we have two genuine keys for the Hyundai, but before we start it, I need to make sure the fluids are good. So I think we have managed to escape some more serious damage because the inlet manifold here is plastic, but it looks like it's just been missed by all the stuff that's been pushed back when the car's been crashed. But we actually do not have any coolant in the car at all, as you can see, but I will put that down to the fact the radiators took a bit of a sting. So the final thing we need to check before we start the car is making sure it's got some oil in it. So luckily this car actually comes with a dipstick even though most of my cars these days don't. There's definitely some in there. Is it a healthy amount is the question. I'd say we're looking top notch, top tier. We're ready for a start. Can I have a uh, key please my friend? On the dash. So the car is now ready for its first start, well, potential first startup. Let's see how things go. If the car does run, I think we are off to a good start on this project. I'm a little bit nervous. I can move the seat now. Wow. So we are armed with our two fresh keys straight out of the box. And we have our little engine start button down here. Let's see, well, ignition on first, I guess. Oh, maybe not. She's on. Hey. Okay, we've got a few warning lights. We've got traction control, tire pressure, ABS. I think that's a collision warning, but it sounds good. It sounds sweet. That's, oh, sounds all right. Race mode, where you at? Oh yeah, there. Whoa. That sounds good. I don't actually think I've got a coolant warning light on the dash. Which is strange. I mean, that is quite a result. At least it starts and it sounds healthy. It sounds good, but there is a lot of lights on the dash. So now I'm armed with a key for the car and I can actually start it. Let's pull it forward and have a proper look around it. Hopefully it starts this time anyway. It's in full grandma driving position, I can't lie, but we are off. Will it move under its own power? Oh. I think it's just the tie rod that's broken, so I should, in theory, be able to drive it forwards because the wheel is straight, so I think we're just going to go with sending it. Definitely ain't wanting to move, but, you know. So it does manage to move at least forwards and backwards under its own steam. It wasn't that easy getting it here because while it was coming off the back of the trailer, we did have to keep kicking the front wheel back into tow just to make sure that, you know, the car was going to go straight, but it is here now. So now if you don't know what these look like, you can get a real good picture of the full 360 view. And I think it is, even though given it's a high end night, it's still a pretty good looking car. That would be if it weren't for a few kind of dents or scrapes anyway. Now, one thing with salvage cars that's always sort of interesting is seeing and trying to figure out really what kind of person has owned it before. And normally you can do that by what's left inside the car. So let's see what we have. A lot of parking tickets, all from Stratford upon Avon. So that's probably gives an idea of where the car's from but there's not really much in here. As far as salvage cars go, this one's pretty tidy. But if I was to guess what sort of person owned this car, I think I've got a good idea. And I'm not one to stereotype, but if I was to stereotype, this is what I'm thinking. So the seat in position for me, a little bit odd. So it's it was kind of, when I got in the car first, it was way back here. So it's someone quite tall that's owned this car before and it's quite high up. So I feel like there might be if I had to generalise a little bit older, you know, not necessarily 19, 20, 21, because you know what, us boy racers would like to sit a bit lower, but there's another reason why I know that it's not a boy racer that's owned this car. And that's because the only item that's left in here is a bottle of soda water. So we know that it's gotta be someone middle-aged, I think, that's drinking this. But that's if I had to stereotype. So let's, let's not dwell on that too much. But apart from that, as far as salvage cars go, this is pretty much immaculate it just needs a good clean there's a little bit of mold growing on the seat belts in the back but apart from that it ain't bad in here and just so you guys can see when you start it up this is what it looks like so we've got our screen here which i presume as i said earlier does have apple carplay i feel like it would oh end mode i like the sound of that yes look at that get all your g-force and everything but anyway so you can see here, we've got kind of like a half, we've got like a little screen in the middle and then two traditional dials either side. And when you start it, 
I don't like that warning like the check limited slip differential. That's not a nice one. That's one of those ones that could be expensive, I think. But anyway, this is kind of what the cockpit looks like while you're driving. I'm guessing this is the name of the original owner here. So, hi Jake, thanks for the car. Now, I've just hooked my phone up to the screen and the Apple CarPlay doesn't work. So, I'm not 100% sure why, but I'm sure there's a very good, simple reason. Although that is the least of my worries at the moment. Now, I should, in theory, be able to take this plastic covering off because now I've got a key. So, I should be able to put the window up. But let's see if we can do that. Christmas Day. Oh, sorry, these have got to go, they're just disgusting. So obviously with this car, it does have a few little imperfections. So I think it's only right we quickly run through those. So the first thing is on the boot. There is a slight nick just there, but it's definitely perfectly salvageable and not worth replacing this panel for. Now, the next thing, the back bumper. This one probably I think this one needs to go. It's got a hole in it. It's scuffed up to a next level. I'd be interested to know how this car has got damage on the back and the front at the same time. It's, it's a bit of a strange one. Then coming round a bit, there is also some damage on the rear quarter, which has took a good knock and is a little bit out of shape. But it does actually look slightly worse than it is just because of the way that the bumper sat. So if the bumper was sat where it should be, this damage wouldn't look as bad. I think it actually only comes to about here with a tiny little bit just here, so not too bad. There is a small scratch on the front, so we have got a little bit of damage that needs to be repaired. Um, starting from around here, the wing, obviously, this one's toast, we need to get a new one. I think as far as I can tell though, the inner wing is actually okay, so it should just be that outer skin that needs replacing, but we won't properly know until we get that off. Now, suspension-wise, I can't see a reason why anything under here would actually be too horrendous but like i said it's uh i think there's definitely a at least an inner tie rod that's broken there because the steering just isn't playing ball one bit so next thing the car needs most definitely is a headlight because well there's not much left of this one so luckily i think those aren't actually too expensive for the i30n but knowing my look i'll probably find that this one's a specific headlight which only comes on the end model or something like that but I can't see that being the case at least. Then obviously we are completely missing a front bumper, so we need to sort one of those out. I'll probably try and find one that's complete rather than buying all the individual pieces because it always works out slightly better. So that's definitely my plan of action with that. And then also we can see down here, kind of the Rad Pack has took a bit of a hit, but the crash bar is actually okay. That's not too bad, um, but also the radiator. That looks a bit bent and I'm sure there'll be a little bit more when we strip that back so that definitely is a good inspection. But the question is, did I get good value for money on this car? Well really, in my opinion, it's a tough question to answer. So this car has got 30,000 miles on it, it's a 2019, so that means it's actually got one year of warranty left but somehow I don't think this damage will be covered but I paid £7,900 for it. And considering something with about the same age and mileage would go for, I think, about 20, I don't think I've done too bad. So I've contacted Hyundai to see what it would cost in parts from them to fix my crash-damaged Hyundai i30N. And their total price in parts was £9,186.76. So I guess that makes it a little bit more obvious as to why the car's written off. But I think we can do it for a bit cheaper than that. Now, we have got a problem down here. This wheel is just all over the place. The hub is not looking good and well the track rod end has completely snapped out the hub itself so i think we need to get to work and start just here so we kick work straight off on this hyundai with no messing about i've already ordered some parts because i was able to see some bits that i needed without even jacking the car up now the main goal here is not to get the car perfect or get the running gear perfect i just want to get it mobile again so i can get it moved off my driveway and maybe into the garage so i can work in the evenings or when it's raining or any time that suits me nice so first thing is is this wheel okay is that a crack or a gouge gouge gouge, gouge. I think it's all right. Yeah, I do. I think it's worth trying. It? Yeah, just just to get it around. Is that a nice? Uh, is that a hole? That'll see another day. That will. So let's have a look what's going on here. So the hub has well and truly had it. That's sheared off there. That's why we have no steering at all. But everything else 
actually looks all right. So that hub definitely does need changing. But before I do that, I want to take the wing off. One, so I can see what I'm doing better. And two, so you guys can see what I'm doing better. So the first step to that is taking the arch liner out. And then I can take all the bolts out for the wing and get it off the car. Bin. No, we don't bin anything. I've learned that. So to remove the wing off the Hyundai, I believe there was three bolts on the top in the kind of bonnet shut area. There was a couple around where the headlight go. There was some in the door shut and then some behind the arch liner tucked up by the door shut as well. So there was plenty hiding around everywhere. Now, I think the good thing about rebuilding something like this Hyundai compared to the Jag, which we're rebuilding on the channel at the moment as well, is that this car shares body panels with, you know, the more normal Hyundai i30 as well. So it's much easier to find parts for, which is a good thing. And even the bumpers actually come on the N-line models too, so that should make it a lot easier. You've only gone and jinxed it. Right, it's bad news. It's well, it's not that bad. So we've got these kind of bits of, what do you call them, I suppose, tin bits? Whatever they are anyway, they're all crumpled. So this one here is kind of like the inner wing bracket, and we've got this one here as well, which obviously connects this leg to this one here. Uh, and also is holding up all of the fuse box, the air box, everything like that. And it's all just, well, it's had a good whack. And realistically, because we're not bodging it, it needs replacing. You can see the bend in it here, the little split. We've got, obviously this one here is supposed to be kind of way out here. So it's miles off really. But the good news is the chassis leg is how it's supposed to be. And that's the main bit, because that would be a ball ache to fix. These, they're inconvenient, but they're definitely doable. I actually thought this one was going to be a super easy bolt on some new panels and get it going, but I'm not actually mad that this is like this because well, I suppose it gives me the opportunity to learn how to do something new. Okay, maybe I'm a bit mad. Apologies about the mic situation as well. I know it's not perfect, but we're just making do with what we've got for now while the car is on the driveway. It's it's so crap in there. You may notice that a lot of the time I use this impact gun on quite a lot of things, which maybe you shouldn't be using an impact on, but I purposefully got a really rubbish impact to make sure I wasn't going to be snapping bolts with left, right and centre, because I know what I'm like. Can someone explain why these have got like 10 written on them and 8 when it's nothing to do with the size that they are? Is it the strength of the bolt, you reckon? So now it's just to remove the caliper from the disc. We're going to be keeping this caliper in place to save bleeding it. And also we want the brake pads and disc to match the other side so they wear equally. So it's just the two caliper bolts off the back that frees it off the car. And then we can relax the piston and then hang the caliper to make sure that we don't damage the brake line. Then the ball joint has to come off the bottom. There was three nuts, or well, two nuts and one bolt actually. And then up top, we've got to take the top mount bolts off. I believe again, there was three 14 mils, but these were actually hidden underneath the kind of windscreen scuttle, which was held in with the most useless clips I have ever come across. They just did not want to come out without breaking, but I think there's probably a better alternative that I can use when I'm putting this back together. And I've just realized, I've completely forgot to mention, we've got the best Northern mechanic helping us out today, Bertie. He has offered to come down. It's actually a bank holiday on the day where we were filming. So we thought it'd be pretty chill to get outside, get on the driveway and just have a laugh working on the cars together. So that was quite enjoyable. So now we're just working together to get this kind of suspension upright off the car. And then we can start looking at what we're going to swap over from the new one that we've got to the old one or vice versa and seeing what we can make work. And then once we've done that, we can then start putting on the new upright and hopefully get the car working again. So we start by putting in the new suspension first, the shock spring and top mount as one unit. This is a new item and not the same as the one that we took off. I promise you, I know some of you aren't going to believe it. Once that's on the car, we can then start assembling the new hub section and sliding that up onto the shock. And there is a little locating pin on the back of here, which I missed. And we ended up fighting with for two minutes or so just to get it in place properly. But once it was turned, then we can slot this up nicely and get it bolted up then on goes the drive shaft nuts and also the three bolts for the ball joint at the bottom too and we can get all that tightened up then the next thing to do is reassemble the brakes so the new hub came with actually a disc and a caliper as well but the disc had quite a bit of lip on it and this one wasn't too bad and also is going to match the driver's side which doesn't need replacing so we put the old disc back on the car with the old pads and the old caliper to make sure it's in fitting with what's on the rest of the car now we have two problems from here, the first one being this track rod end that has a little insert from the hub which is completely stuck on it and we can't get it off so we need to get some butane gas 
to be able to heat that up and then we can hopefully get that back off there and we can get the old track rod end bolted into the hub just for now and also we need to try and sort out this wheel and tire situation for it to be mobile we need to try and get this tire or get a new tire popped onto the rim just so we can move the car around so i took that wheel and tire down to my mate josh's garage and he was then able to try and put the old tire back on unfortunately i didn't work but we had a michelin line around that was just the perfect fit so that popped straight on there you can sling it in the boot and get it back on the car so it's now the next day and as you can see the weather's took a bit of a turn and the car is still stuck outside because i can't get that hub insert off the track rod end and seeing as we're going to be replacing the track rod end anyway i don't think there's too much point wasting hours and hours trying to solve that problem when in, i'm just going to go and buy a new one so i guess really what i need to be doing now is start the hunt for parts really and see exactly where i'm going to be getting all of these bits from so we're going to need to find a bonnet a wing a bumper a slam panel a radiator an air comrade an intercooler a wheel arch liner we're going to need to find these tin pieces which are probably going to come from hyundai we're going to need to find a track on end a wing a rear bumper there is a lot of parts to find for this car so let's get inside out of this dreary british weather and go on the parts hunt so last time we did this you guys seemed to enjoy it when we were looking for parts for the jag so it kind of makes sense to do the same thing again if you guys like seeing it and like seeing what goes on behind the scenes when you're rebuilding the car and how we find the parts well let's do it all over again so this time i'm armed slightly differently because i actually have the parts list from hyundai here so i've got a complete breakdown of what every single part is going to cost to rebuild the car it's slightly tricky deciphering what part actually is what but i can search the part number and get a good idea so that's definitely very helpful so in an ideal world i want to try and get everything from one place especially if i've got to collect it because i don't want to be running here there and everywhere wasting my time trying to get you know a bonnet hinge and then a parking sensor because it's just going to take me forever so listings like this where there's a full car breaking if they have everything i need i am willing to pay a little bit more just to get it from one place but let's give these guys a ring and see what they say now i have noticed this listing here this is for a hyundai i30 n line model so it looks exactly like an n but is basically a slower car, so it's a sheep in wolf's clothing, if that makes sense. So this car aesthetically looks exactly the same as mine. So the bonnet will fit, the bumper will fit, the headlight will fit, the wing will fit, the rear bumper will fit, so that's absolutely fine. But the Rad Pack is different. Otherwise, to be honest with you, I probably would have just gone and bought this, because this is a complete front end, including the Rad Packs and everything like that for £3,600 and that should pretty much assemble the full front end of the car and get that sorted if I didn't have the slight differences with the radiators and intercoolers and stuff like that so I'm going to leave that one I think because I don't need well I don't need a spare headlight, I don't need a spare wing, I don't need parts that don't fit lying around my house. Now I have messaged one breaker here, hopefully this can focus, I gave him the full list of everything that I was after and he said everything on there has been sold but he does have a rear bumper but the upper section is damaged so that's completely useless now i'm not sure what i think to this this is a 2018 to 2021 hyundai i30n front panel complete slam panel rad pack complete now this is up for 1600 pound but it includes well everything to make the car and the engine run absolutely perfectly again so We've got a new slam panel on the back, which also mounts kind of the radiator, the air rad, and the intercooler, and it includes those as well. Um, we've also got the crash bar on the front, we've got the horns, so in theory, I should be able to unbolt the bit on mine that's broken, basically from the back of the crash bar, pull it off as one unit, bolt this one on, and it's all pre-assembled, so it's just plugging in the hoses, plugging in the plugs, bolting it up, and it's good to go. But it is £1,600, which, I don't know if that's a bit expensive because going back to my list here, I've kind of roughly totted everything up that I can see for the, um, you know, for that to basically build that section up without buying that. And I think brand new it comes to that as well. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to throw the seller an offer, a reasonable one, and just say, look, this is what they cost brand new to buy everything. I'm happy to pay this for yours, which I think is fair. Well, you know what? I'm not having as good a time with this as I thought I was going to. This, I thought, honestly, I thought this was going to be like shopping for cereal in the supermarket or something, just picking parts off a shelf. It's the opposite. There's like, there's so many cars breaking, but the people who are breaking, well, parts have all sold, parts have all sold. Do you know what? If they're all sold, take them off. It's just frustrating. It's just, it's so frustrating, especially when you buy the car 
after looking at this sort of stuff, said, oh yeah, there's plenty of parts available, and then you go to buy them and it's... Well, the people who are selling them haven't even got the parts they're listing. It's I have the same problem with the Jag. It's even down to the headlight, so I've got the part number off the headlight which is broken on the car, and that is G4921220330, which great, there is headlights for sale, but, again, another massive but, there's two different sorts of headlights on the i30. There's the ones with the silver inserts, which are basically these ones here, where around the outside there's like a silver eyeliner almost look, and then there's the ones where it's black, which is what comes on the i30N. And yet again, there is no matching part numbers which are all black for sale. So, my look just amazes me sometimes, honestly. I'm not having fun here. But one thing I did find on the breakdown of parts on here is the daytime running light. So it is just a daytime running light and the price of it is £1,045.81 each. <laughs> So that's £2,000 in daytime running lights if I was to buy them brand new from Hyundai. That that cannot be right, surely. £1,000 for a daytime running light. It's like, it's this big. Especially when, especially when the headlight, which is just here, is £675. So it's cheaper to buy a whole headlight than is a daytime running light. So I think the best bet now is probably ringing around some breakers and speaking to the main dealer about what they can get and how quickly they can get it. And going from there, really, let's make some phone calls. Okay, new day, and it's not a bank holiday anymore, so companies are back open. So I'm gonna ring Hyundai now and see exactly what they're gonna charge me for those structural parts which I need to replace, those little tin sections, and also maybe try and order a couple of bits as well. An I30N, indeed it is. What do you need for it? So, <clears throat> the first bits I need are the, on the, so on the passenger side, the inner wing, the, basically where that, the, sorry, where the wing mounts to, there's like a mounting bracket that comes off the chassis leg. And both for the near side? Uh, yeah, pass, yeah, near side, that's right. <laughs> right, the bit uh, that runs across the top, that, that uh, top, on the left of the photo, yep. they're listing that as a member front wheel apron. So the left hand side is 163.47, no it's not, it's 163.74. Okay. And the whole inner wing is not much different actually, 180.25. Fantastic. Are they in stock, are they? Or? Right, the main inner wing will in fact go to back order if we uh, stick the order through. Right. Because there's none actually in the UK and there's none in transit to the UK, so there's an outside chance that might be a 10 week wait from Korea. Unlikely, but. Possible. possible. No worries. Yeah. That would that would slow it's things good. down. <laughs> well, that's not good news. So, they only sell the section I need as the full inner wing, which means replacing the strut tower all the way back to way behind where you can see essentially, which is a much bigger job than just taking out those sections which we're talking about and just welding in new pieces. So that makes it a much bigger job. And not even just that, like you just said, they're on back order for 10 weeks potentially. So that could really, really slow the build down, which is not what we want to do, especially when there is this one for sale, but this is for the driver's side, so it's obviously going to be no good. But we've got the bracket here. Don't know if you guys can see that. We've got the bracket just here, which we need, which does is just spot welded on. And then this inner piece here, which again is just spot welded and seam sealed on. So it is a replaceable part on the car, but I can't buy it. Which is, again, frustrating. There seems to be a bit of a pattern with this car already. I think some people in this situation might be put off straight away by this, but I refuse to be defeated and I will fix this problem. But I really wanted to give you guys a definitive answer on how I was going to do that on the i30N in this video, but unfortunately I can't because I don't know myself. This is the final part stopping me from driving my Hyundai i30N. Okay, maybe I can drive it forwards and backwards, but at the moment I've got no steering because you may remember from last time we changed this whole corner suspension because it was damaged in the crash that this car was involved in. So after I've done this, I said I could drive it, but maybe not legally. And that final part that is going to stop me from driving the car at the moment anyway is the track run end. Last time we didn't have one that we could fit to the car, but now we do. And as simply as screwing that on, one bolt, 
and that is fastened onto the car and we should have steering again. I simply set this up to where the old one was but we will need tracking in the future to make sure that the car drives straight. Then the final bit, something I've not seen in a long time, is a split pin. That's by far the easiest job that we've got to do in this video, but it is a job ticked off the list. So the home night is now magically teleported to the back garage and we're not going to do anything on the front today. We're actually going to concentrate on the back because the back bumper has a little bit of damage, well, quite a lot of damage because, well, the rear skin has been absolutely annihilated. It's got a hole in it here. Its mounting points are not looking good and also the rear quarter is not healthy either because, well, that's took a bit of a shunt too. Now, I wouldn't know necessarily what to do with this in order to get it back into shape, but luckily I know someone who does. You may remember Joe. Hi, Joe. Oh. Joe used to work for me and now works in a body shop which does insurance repairs. So essentially, this is you all day, isn't it? No enough. So Joe's brought all sorts of stuff with him and we're gonna now try and tackle getting this rear quarter back into shape. I haven't really got faith in me, but I have 100% faith in Joe, so we'll be all right. So the first step to getting this sorted is stripping it down. So we're gonna get the lights out, we're gonna get the bumper off and see if there's anything else that we can take out to make access to this paddle a little bit easier. Let's do this. The first thing which we've got to remove from the car is the rear lights, not the section in the boot, only the section in between the bumper and the rear quarter. There's two 10 mils hidden under two little covers in the boot shut and then it slides out of its retaining clips. Then straight onto the bumper skin itself, there was a couple of clips and a couple of 10 mils hidden by those lights. Then for everything else we really need to get the car up in the air and that's because there's a few bolts in each of the wheel arch liners and also underneath the back bumper because the crash bar attaches in a very strange way. From memory, there was four Phillips head screws in each of the arches which hold on the arch liner to the bumper. And from underneath, there are some clips which hold on the crash bar. Okay, I may have just missed filming taking this off, but it wasn't too exciting. But this bumper is a little bit strange because you've got like this solid crash bar cross member thing in the bumper and it comes off with the bumper, which I haven't seen before. So that's a little bit odd, but everything else back here looks okay. That looks all good, but obviously we are gonna have to do some repair work because this bumper, the skin itself has had it. Let's get this bit off. Joe, take it away. Nice work. So luckily this bumper bracket survived the accident, but Joe pops that off with his expertise. So next step before we can do anything with this is we've got to get it back to bare metal. So we have grindy boy. Nim, nim. So before we can start really working the panel, we've got to get all of the paint off first. So using that grinder, we start taking away the paint to get it ready to be beaten back into shape. Now, some of you may know my background is detailing, so doing stuff like this for me is, well, it feels completely backwards. It feels wrong. Normally, I'd be polishing paint with a soft polishing pad and polish, but at the moment, I'm using an angle grinder. But Joe is doing his best to teach me this process so I can do it for myself, hopefully in the future, because practice really is the only way to learn. That was easy. <laughs> So right at the bottom of the wheel arch, this had been pushed in, so Joe taps this out and slowly taps it back into shape. That was pretty good, that actually. <laughs> and as quickly as that, that is then done, and then we can start pulling out the more awkward sections of the panel. So Joe just uses a mini belt sander just to take off any last little bits of paint because we want to try and get as clean a weld to the panel as possible. What's next then, Joe? Tell us what's next. Got the miracle pull on it. Miracle pull on here. We've got it back to metal, so what does that do? Is it weld bits? To that? Yeah, a uh, couple of these tabs. Yep. And pull a bar through there, then pull it out. Pull it? Yeah. Do we heat it up? Uh, no. Is that hot? No. Is it? Right, how can I feel how strong it is? Yeah. What? <laughs> no way. It's literally <laughs> welded. Isn't it? That's mad. 
So after I'd wrapped my head around how strong these tiny little welds are, Joe could then put more of these in a straight line down the panel where the damage is, uh, so he could attach the bar and then the puller to that. So the way this works is it spreads the load over multiple areas over the panel and then you use this puller to then stretch the metal back into its original shape. Now we were working with fairly limited tools and if you were doing this at a professional standard then you'd have much more equipment on hand. But you can slowly see the metal starting to form back into its original shape but this does also cause high spots and these will need tapping down. But before we do that we need to pull out any little low spots which are left and Joe uses this kind of isolated puller which does the same thing as the other one just on a much smaller more precise way and now it's my turn to make a mess of this job entirely and what we're trying to do here as i said earlier is tap down those high spots because you can't fill over high spots if that makes sense so we need to make sure that the panel is going to look completely flat when we're done and at this point although i thought it was looking pretty good joe still wasn't a hundred percent happy so he wanted to go in from behind the panel which luckily was quite accessible and then we used a piece of wood to actually beat the panel out from behind. This gave a much cleaner edge because we could be much more precise and also brutal with it but again once that was done the high spots needed tapping down again. So we are now just about back in shape and I think I'm pretty happy with that. Joe's just mixing up a bit of filler now and we're just going to try and take off the low and, well it's just the low spots I guess isn't it? So hopefully then it should look pretty straight. You'll see why in the future that I'm not too bothered about this repair being like 1000% perfect. So Joe then mixes up some filler and lays a skim of this all over the areas that we've been working. Most of which will have to be removed by sanding. Now I'm going to be real, I don't really like showing you guys bodywork because a lot of you think that really good body shops use like zero filler and that anything involving filler is a bodge where this just simply isn't the case. A lot, well, every body shop uses filler. It's all about going through the process to get the end result looking right. And obviously you want to use as little filler as possible, but it's, it's just one of those things. When it's got to be used, it's got to be used. So the filler is now dry and ready to sand back. So Joe's going to block it. I'm going to help out, of course. And then we have also got a new rear bumper, which needs all of the bits and bobs transferring over to it too. But first, we have got to do this. How do we do it, Joe? Just like that. Yep. Nice. So with a sanding block, we start then to flat back the filler to get it, the panel back to its original shape. Like I said, most of the filler which was applied will also be removed. This is essentially used just to fill in the last few low spots that we couldn't get out by beating the panel. But it will also highlight any high spots too, like this one which Joe found, so he gave that another quick tap down before we went over it with a glaze. Okay, so we're now waiting to do a little bit more work in the rear quarter, but it just needs a bit of time. So the next thing we're going to look at is the bumper. Or as you lot think I pronounce it, bumper. So here we have the old one here and the new one here. This is a genuine brand new bumper from Hyundai. Hun from Hyundai. Hyundai. It's Hyundai. Hyundai by the way. And you can see why we're replacing it here. So we've got a massive crack and all this kind of gouging out of this one. But the actual trims and everything in this bumper are all, as far as I can tell, okay. There is a scuff on this parking sensor here, but that can be sorted by a body shop very, very easily. So what I'm gonna do now is transfer everything over from this bumper into this one, and then that one can go on the car once this repair's done. So the skin for the bumper itself was actually surprisingly cheap from Hyundai and it was only £200 which I thought was a really good price. Bumpers and the actual cost of them mainly comes from all the bits and accessories that go with them which is precisely the reason why I want to try and find a complete front bumper rather than just buy in bits. But while I'm transferring everything over Joe then sands back the glaze with a DA. But everything here is pretty simple really. The most strange part I thought was this, you know, rear cross member piece, which again was clipped onto the bumper, so I don't know how much it actually does. And then the final thing to remove from the old bumper is this kind of lower diffuser section, which was looking, even though in one piece, it really needed a good clean. So I went over this with a magic sponge and an all-purpose cleaner, which really, really brought it back to life.
And once that was cleaned up and looking as good as new, we could then stick that onto the new bumper as the first piece and work backwards from there. And that just clipped in with six screws, two in the middle and four on the ends. And then once that was on, we could then pop on the rear cross member. Oh, and also let's not forget these two lower grills as well. And then on with the rear cross member. This clips in with six clips, two higher up, and then four along the lower diffuser part, which fold over the bottom of it and then clip through, if that makes any sense. But in the time it took me to do this, Joe had absolutely smashed out that rear quarter and got it completely finished, bar a lick of paint anyway. So here is where we are at. The rear quarter is just about there. There's a few little tiny bits which you'll need to go over when the car gets painted, but that is absolutely fine for now. So now that is all sorted. The rear bumper is now reassembled. So we have the new one over here. So that is now ready to go on the car. It looks kind of good in satin black, I can't lie. So Joe, are you ready to get this bumper on? Yep. Let's do this. So the dream team of me and Joe worked together to get the bumper back on the car. There's one plug for the exhaust valve and also one, I believe, for the parking sensors. So once those are plugged in, the bumper can be slotted onto the car and into the rear quarter clips. And then we can put the screws in underneath the lights and then pop the lights back into place too. So now the final step, just to protect this area so the bare metal doesn't rust and whatever else, we're just gonna hit it with some primer and leave it like that until the car eventually goes to the body shop much further down the line. More specifically an etch primer because this allows it to stick to the bare metal a lot better, but this will probably all be sanded off when it actually goes to the body shop. It's just of more a temporary protective measure. It's not gonna do loads though. So there we have it, the rear quarter is now repaired. As I said, we're not aiming it for a thousand percent. You'll see in the future why that is but it is absolutely fine for now. Joe has absolutely smashed it. The new rear bumper is on also, and that is gonna look wicked when it's all painted up, because, well, obviously it's brand new, so it could not look perfect. So very quickly, it has started coming together, because now, apart from paint, the back of the car is sorted, but there is still plenty of work to do up here. So on the whole, I'm pretty happy with that. I can't really complain. And like I said, there's very good reason why I'm doing it like this, but it will all be explained to you guys in the future. Now, next thing to look at is the front end, which is pointless starting to assemble at the moment because we have these tin sections on the car, which are damaged at the moment. And some of you guys have said, just bend these back, which I definitely could do, but you know, this one is slightly ripped here. And this one has took a fair shunt in this direction, causing it to crease up here and bending it, even though it's fine, it is not perfect. And while I'm not aiming for perfection back there, this is a bit which is gonna be staying exactly as it is. And that is why I have bought this. Jesus Christ, that was a mission to open, but I got there in the end. And this is essentially a chassis leg for, well, it is a chassis leg for an i30N. And I'm not gonna be using the whole thing because of the way it's been cut. It's been cut from the front of the strut tower. So it's actually no good, but the bits I need are perfectly fine. So that'd be this wing bracket here and this inner kind of bracket here. Now these are all spot welded on, as you can see. So it should be nice and easy to change over. I don't think on those bits, as far as I can tell, they actually use any seam sealer. Oh no, tell the light, there's a squiggle of it here. So it's not too bad at all. So luckily the bits that I need are perfectly fine, even though this has come off a damaged car too. So on this one, the wing bracket here at the top is bent, so I'm not gonna use that, but this is the one I need, and this one here, which are both perfectly straight. And once you've seen that, you can really tell how damaged this one is. It's punched just here and up there, so 
Even though, like you guys said, you could pull it out, I really don't want to. So hopefully now you understand the method behind my madness a little bit. Now, one thing which I'm not sure about is, like I mentioned already, these are spot welded on. Now, when you drill these spot welds out, it leaves a hole bigger than what the spot weld would have been originally. And with some cars, like I've learned, some of these are supposed to be replaced with spot welds, and some of them, when being repaired, you're supposed to use self-piercing rivets, because it's not exactly a part of the car which holds any particular structure, it's just a bracket to put the wing in the right position. So self-piercing rivets or spot welds, I'm not sure. So if any of you work for Hyundai and know exactly what I'm supposed to do here, leave a comment down below. The past couple of weeks, I've really been neglecting my Hyundai i30N. The last time you guys seen it, we did some work on the rear end by replacing the rear bumper with a brand new skin from Hyundai and also pulling out the rear quarter to get that back into shape. So now the back end of the car is ready for paint, but the front end is a long way off. Because apart from repairing the suspension damage, which we've already done, the front end of the car, I have not touched one bit. It needs a new bonnet, it needs a new wing, it needs a new headlights, it needs a new rad pack and slam panel. But before any of that, we've got to replace these bits here because these bits got a little bit crumpled in the crash. So I've nipped down to my local screw fix and picked up a cheap little mini belt sander. And on top of that, I've also borrowed this drill bit, which is specific for taking out spot welds. And I've also got the new pieces here, which I'm going to replace those ones with. And you can see around the edge, these are all the spot welds, which I need to remove. And then once those are off, I'll be able to remove those tin bits from that section, which I've got there and transfer them over to my car, which will then give me the perfect base to start building the car back up. Let's do this. So this is a first for me. I've never had to do any real structural work on a car before, and I've especially never had to do drilling out spot welds and re-welding panels on, so bear with me here a little bit. So I started off by drilling pilot holes and then going in with the spot weld drill bit until I got all the way through the weld. Okay, so there we have it. The first bracket is now removed. It did actually turn out that the drill bit that I borrowed originally is actually really blunt. So I wasn't really making great progress. I nipped out, got a new drill bit, and it cut through it like a hot knife through butter. So there's one part off. I've kind of got the knack for doing it now, I think. We can start on with the rest of it now. The outer wing bracket had been removed. Now it was time for this internal kind of chassis brace part. There was a lot of welds here, probably about 50 maybe in total. So it did take quite a while to get through them all. But after a couple of hours, I did start getting there and it did become loose until I could wiggle it off that cut of chassis leg, which I had. Let me tell you, that was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. And it took a lot longer than I thought it was going to as well. And it's definitely not the cleanest work I've ever done, but it will do the job. And that is now both the brackets I needed removed from the cut of the chassis leg, which I bought. So as you can see here, I've got the new wing bracket, which is going to mount something like that. So you can see this one. Well, it probably was savable, to be honest with you guys. are probably right, but I've already got this bit now. And I've also got this piece here, which is going to mount just here. Hopefully taking the ones that I don't need off the car is going to be at least a little bit easier. Spoiler alert, it really wasn't, but I had to access them. So the thing that I had to do first was remove all of the stuff that was going to get in the way. So that's the fuse box, the air box, and the battery and battery tray. The great thing with this car is it only seems to have two sorts of fittings, 10 mils or 12 mils. So you only really need two tools to do, as far as I can tell, pretty much everything on this car. Once those were out of the way, I then cut off the parts that I didn't need to make access to the spot welds a little bit easier and then started drilling away at those too. And if I'm being real, I did get a little bit tired of it here, so I may have called in some help. But after hours and hours of drilling and chiseling, eventually we started to make some progress and this inner brace did start to come off the car. To make removing it that little bit easier, we cut a section of this out, obviously because we don't need it, and that means that we could remove it in halves instead. And finally, we got them off the car, so now I could start cleaning up the new sections using my new little finger belt sander just to make sure that this surface was going to be as clean as possible and weld to the chassis leg as nicely as it can. So then it was time to transfer that onto the car itself by welding it into place, or more specifically, spot welding it.
So there we have the new pieces welded on and it is looking pretty much as factory apart from the paint side of things and there is one other thing missing which is a bit of seam sealer which runs across here at the top as can be seen on this side here, it runs up to this edge. So I'm now gonna try and recreate that on this side. It's probably not that important, but I just want it to look the part. Just using some polyurethane sealer, I've run it down that seam and then go over it a couple of times to try and recreate the factory look. It's not 100%, but it will definitely do the job. And once it's painted over, I don't think you'll even notice it. So the final step here is getting this color coded to the rest of the car. So I've masked off the car roughly, but it's not too important because, well, a lot of the car is either being painted or scrapped anyway. So I've just used my favorite pink towel to cover off some of it there. The bonnet doesn't matter. Just cover it off the engine bay quickly. I'm gonna spray with real low pressure because, well, the finish on here, I'm just gonna try and match this. It's, it's definitely not as good as like the outer body of the car. So I'm just gonna aim to try and get it close to that. And the first step to doing that is etch priming all of the bare metal parts to make sure that the paint is gonna stick to those properly. And once I'm happy that that's done and dry, we can then swap over to our base coat. The color for this is called Performance Blue. So I went down to my local paint suppliers and got a liter of that and sprayed over with a super low pressure, one to minimize overspray, but two to make a bad finish the same as on the other side of the engine bay. Now we have those structural pieces sorted, the car can start going back together and we can start with the engine bay itself and all the bits that we had to take out in order to repair that damage. The first thing to go back in is the fuse box which is held in with three 10 mils, one on the strut tower and then two on that piece that we've replaced. I feel like having those structural parts done is a weight off my shoulders and it's definitely the much better way of doing it than trying to pull them back into shape because once they're bent like that, they're never gonna be quite the same. Now we have the battery tray back in place and also the ECU bolted in too. So now it's just to plug that in and then we can refit the battery. And then finally, the airbox. Well, the airbox from the car was actually damaged in the crash, so won't be going back on. So just for a temporary measure, we're gonna borrow this Ram air filter, which came off Matt's Lambo until we get something else sorted. So now that structural piece on the car is now sorted and it is back together, we can start looking at reassembling the car, but we all know I'm a fan of the modification here or there. So the guys at RPM Performance have kindly sent us out these pair of bloody boomerangs, mate. What do you think I'm going to say to you? No. Correct, goodbye. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was awful, but these are wishbone strengthening plates. So essentially they, well the clues in the name, they strengthen the wishbones, but they stop things flexing because these are the standard I30 wishbones. These add a bit more rigidity to them and if you do end up pushing the car a bit harder, these are gonna take it. Let's get it didgeridone. Okay, so this is the underside of the wishbone right now and you can see right here we've got a bolt and two nuts for the ball joint and then there's four holes, one, two, three, four, and these are the locating points for those wishbone strengthening plates. So we're gonna start by taking these off and then put it on and back on with these, and then we can use the bolts and nuts which come supplied to bolt it into here. I hope you guys can see that. So the first step to that, if I didn't explain it very well in the first place, is undoing the ball joint at the bottom. So that was three 17 mils. Now I can pop those back in once that strengthening plate was in place. As you can see, this is a really easy install. After those three are back in for the ball joint, there's then just four bolts to pop in, which come supplied with the kit. These are 19 mils, they go through the holes from the factory wishbone and then into the strengthening plate. You tighten those up and away you go.
So I just wanted to say a massive thank you to the guys at RPM Performance for shipping out those wishbone strengthening plates. They have also sent us some other bits, but we're going to come back to them at a later date. We've got some more to do on the repair side of things for now. So I guess this is the next stage in the rebuild part, because now I'm ready on the wing side at least to put a new body panel on, but there is no point in me doing that until I've got this mess sorted. Now I could go to the main dealer or look online for the individual parts to replace and strip it down and see exactly what I need and what I don't and you know see if I can get away with some bits and see which bits I definitely can't get away with. But I just don't really see the point in doing that when I can just go and buy this. This is a complete new rad pack and slam panel in one. So that includes the actual structure itself. It includes the fan on the back, which this alone is 450 quid from the main dealer. It includes a bunch of hoses. It includes the horns, which are a common failure point on these cars. It includes the intercooler, the air comrad, and the radiator. Now, although the crash bar on my car is a little scuffed up, I'm happy to say that that is reusable, along with this lower piece down here too. So once I've got those stripped off, it should be pretty easy to take the old rad pack off the car, pop this new one on, and we know that everything is okay then. So the first thing to remove it is the headlight. This is just holding with three bolts and some clips, so that comes off really, really easily. And then we can start looking at the crash bar and slam panel. So the way that this is held on is with two 12 mils which hold the crash bar to the slam panel and then four 12 mils which go through the crash bar and the slam panel into the chassis leg. And then quickly inside the wheel arch, there's a brake cooling vent which we can remove with four clips. And a 10mm at the bottom of the wing which holds the slam panel to the wing and that chassis bracket which we'd already replaced on the other side. And now all of that's loose from the car, we can start removing some of the hoses. So we've got a top and bottom radiator hose to remove. and also the aircon hoses to remove. Now these are held in with two 10 mils, but do be careful if your aircon system is still pressurized, this will release gas, which is really toxic. Obviously mine has a big hole in it, so that has already been depressurized. And then the final bit before we can get this off is the bonnet latch cable. Right, I've made a bit of a balls up here because I'm sort of trapped until I take this lower radiator hose off and well, it's definitely still going to have some water in it, so I'm probably going to get soaked. So there is three hoses left at the bottom of the rad pack, so we've got the intercooler, so there's one in and out for that, and also the bottom radiator hose. And after I've got those jubilees undone, the intercooler hoses can come off, and also the final clamp for that lower radiator hose. So now the rad pack is off the car. There is the rad pack and slam panel off the car, and I'm actually feeling really, really lucky. Well, I'm feeling lucky and grateful. Lucky because, well, the car was millimeters from being in a much worse state. This is a plastic inlet manifold here. You've got the throttle body here with a plastic casing on the end. You've also got all of these pipes and everything like that are just here. And the rad pack got pushed back and it was touching these areas. So if the collision was any worse, it would have damaged a whole lot more. And also as well, I'm very grateful that the crash can, you know, the, where the, the crash bar attaches to isn't damaged as well. Because just centimeters above that, maybe one or two, that is where most of the damage happened to the car. So if that was an inch or two lower, this could have quite easily been a category B and never gone back on the road. But I think we got away pretty lightly. One other thing I want to say as well is this car is actually really, really nice to work on. So. And actually, I'd fully recommend it. If you want to get into spannering and working on your own car, an i30N seems like a pretty good choice. Now, the only rubbish bit that I've spotted so far is the wiring that we've got just here, which comes straight out of the fuse box. And the end of these two have completely been ripped off, and I have no idea what they're for, so that could cause us a problem. Well, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that Hyundai are going to sell the plug so I can repair those, because without it, I mean, it goes right into this fuse box loom and that's just going to be a nightmare. So now we've established that I've got away pretty lightly really, we can get the new one on. Now this way around it should be a doddle, so we've just got to get the whole new rad pack into place, get a couple of bolts in to hold it in, and then we can start reconnecting all of the hoses. And 
And once they're on, I can then put the crash bar in place with the two 10mm which hold it to the rad pack, and then we can put the 12mm in which bolt that and the slam panel into the chassis leg. Okay, rad pack is now done, slam panels all bolted on, and now it's time to see whether the bonnet will close. Now, I made this mistake on the Jag and got it stuck down. It was so much work to try and get it back open again, so I'm gonna do it before I put the front bumper on, and that way I can adjust the mechanism, if it needs it, to suit the bonnet, which doesn't fit anyway because the hinges are bent. Logic. Anyway, let's try it. I mean, it looks good. I mean, you can't argue with that. That was precision. I think. So the final step is getting some coolant in the car. And there's a bit of a debate online, I think, about what coolant you're actually supposed to use in the i30N. And I think the reason behind that is because they come from Korea with yellow coolant in, which I don't think we use in the UK. And then it gets taken out. And then that gets replaced, I think, with blue or green and then that mixes with the yellow coolant which is left in the system and makes this real bright kind of luminous green coolant which you see in the header tank and well I haven't got that and the local parts place is shut and what I have got is some G11 coolant here which I think online they say is okay for these but it's definitely better to have some coolant in than none so I'm just gonna put this in. So now just to pop back on the wheels and get the car back on the floor and start her up. And enjoy myself a nice cup of coffee while the cooling system bleeds. Whilst we're waiting for that, let's just take a little throwback to when I first got this car and the first video I did in it. There was a few people laughing at me in the comments because I said the Apple CarPlay didn't work. Well, apparently it does work, but it only works with the USB cable, which, well, that's just not in this decade, is it? So the guys at One Car Stereo have sent me this. Now what this should enable us to do is use Apple CarPlay wirelessly in a car where it only allows a wide connection. So it comes with this little box here, which I'm gonna place just there, and also a couple of cables as well. So this end will go into the car just there, and this end goes into the box just there. There. And straight away, what's this we have here? So all we do on the phone is go for this here, Auto Kit T-Box, pair, and then as quickly as that, what do we know? We have Apple CarPlay wirelessly in the i30N. Now I'm gonna leave a link for these in the description, so go and grab yourself one. Remember, it only works on cars with a wired CarPlay connection where you wanna make it wireless, so just bear that in mind and make sure your car's compatible before you buy it. So there we have the coolant system fully bled up now and the full rad pack on the front is all working perfectly apart from the aircon which obviously has to be regassed at some point. But progress is good, I feel like we're flying through the i30M but we still have more to go on it because we're still missing some obvious bits on the front end of the i30M. The good news for you guys is I do have more parts to get this car a bit closer to the finish line. And the first of those parts to continue the rebuild in this video is this passenger wing just here. Now you may notice it is slightly the wrong shade of blue and it's not off an i30N, but I don't think that makes a difference. In the last video, off camera, I went about painting the back of the wing to match the rest of the car. At least that way you can't see red sticking through any of the panels. And I can leave this side to a professional. And how this wing fits really will be testament to the quality of the repair work which we've already done on this car, seeing as we've replaced one of the wing mounting brackets just here. Now we can only hope they do line up, but there is only one way to find out. Let's get it on. So we kicked this video off with a new wing which I got from Synetic. It was about £200 which I don't think was too bad and worked out about £100 cheaper than buying one brand new from Hyundai. This is attached with a bunch of 10mm which sit in the arch and also some at the top underneath the bonnet. Now because I'm a man who has learned from his mistakes, I haven't chucked anything away for the i30N and I'm glad I haven't at this point because there's a few screws which I needed off the old wing which I thought were just scrap. And they go just here. I feel smug right now. 
Now, frustratingly, the new Rad Pack did actually come with a brake cooling vent on the driver's side, but it didn't come with one on the passenger side, and I'm not able to salvage one off my old Rad Pack because it got damaged in the crash. So I've had to go and buy this from Hyundai. It's a brand new one. It costs £80 for this, which I think is a little bit ridiculous, but not too bad in the grand scheme of things compared to some of the other parts on this car anyway. But apparently this is the last one in the country, so I was pretty lucky to get this. Luckily, this vent was really easy to fit. It was just two 10mm bolts and a few clips which attach it to the arch liner. And then that can be followed by a new wheel arch liner, which again is supposed to be the second last one of this side in the country. So now we can start to fit that up, but one thing which did surprise me with this car, and it might just be me being daft, but it's the amount or the lack of bolts and screws on it. It seems like a lot of the things like the arch liners and stuff like that is just held on with clips, which just doesn't seem that secure to me, but you know, it doesn't rattle around too much, so I'm sure it'll be fine. Now, let me tell you, this is a satisfying feeling having worked on this car and took it apart and got it back together with every single bolt in the right place, all the correct clips used. It's just one of those weird things that when you're rebuilding a car, it always feels like it's never going to be as good as it was, but... It's a proud moment for me. <laughs> now at this point in time, I would like to try and put a new under tray on, but I haven't got one and I haven't bought one from Hyundai either because I think it came to like 360 quid, which I think is a little bit silly for a little hatchback. So I'm gonna see what I can get secondhand. So if you have got an under tray for an i30N, let me know on my Instagram, which is just here. And even if you haven't got one, it's probably a good idea to go and follow me right now because, well, I've got something on this car that you guys are gonna be helping out with and that's how you're gonna do it. So go follow me. So while we're waiting for the rest of the parts to show up for the front end, I still need like a headlight. I need to find a bumper and a bonnet as well. And that really is just a waiting game. But for now, we have some more modifications to be doing. And these ones are actually inside the car. Well, actually, I've had a slight change of heart. The interior is not disgusting in here, but I mean, I've definitely seen nicer before. Let's get it cleaned up first. Now, I know cleaning isn't the most exciting thing in the world, so we're gonna get this done in 15 seconds. Let's do it. Well, that is definitely looking quite a bit smarter. And even though it wasn't too bad, it's nice just to get rid of all of the previous owner's bum crumbs and get it ready for me to own. But now we are on to the next bit. And well, it's something I've never actually fit into a car before. So we're gonna be doing this together. And that is a short shifter from RPM Performance. Again, the same as last time. They've sent this out to me. I'm gonna leave their links in the description. And it goes somewhere underneath well, here, so, well, let's figure it out together. Let's get it done. So the first thing we have to do to fit this RPM Performance short shifter is take out the center console. So the first section comes out just by pulling it. It's only on clips, and then you can release the gear gator from that trim. Now, you don't actually have to remove the gear knob, but if you do want to, give it a good tug and it will come off. Next up, inside the armrest compartment, there's two 10 mils. And then there's six more screws which hold the center console to the car. That's it. Then once all of those are out, you can then remove the center console from the car. I can't believe how easily this comes out, but once that's free, then you've got to take this metal bracket off around the gear stick and the four bolts at each corner, and that will make it so you can access the bottom of the gear selector. Okay, I've done an awful job of filming this, but this is what we've got underneath here. It's actually really easy to take the sense console out. There was two bolts just here. There was two screws here, two screws here, and then two behind the plastic covers down there. And then it literally just pulled out. You can unplug the center console section here super easy. The whole thing is just coming to, it's literally held together with a few screws. It's, it's, it's surprising. But anyway, here we are. I've managed to unclip this just here. You do that by pushing the pin outwards and then pushing it back and then you get to this here. So all I have to do now is take this plastic cover off, if you can see that, put that on here, bolt that onto there and then put it all back together. I promise you someone who's competent could do this in less than 30 minutes. Me, maybe an hour. 
So once we've got the RPM performance bolted onto the bottom of the gear selector with that plastic clip we can start reassembling the car. Starting with the 413mm which hold the gear stick in place, then the 210mm which hold the metal bracket which surrounds it. Then it's back in with the centre console and the six screws and two bolts which hold that into place. And then finally it's on with that last centre trim and the gear knob. Let me tell you, I said in the last video this car is nice to work on. It makes you feel like you're a better mechanic than what you are because everything's just so simple, which realistically is how it should be and, well, that was a nice install. It was actually enjoyable to do because there's nothing that really got you stuck for too long. But let's have a feel of how this short shifter feels. So I wouldn't say this car had a long throw before, but oh, that is no way. It's stiff. A bit too stiff, maybe. I think I've done something wrong. I was getting so excited as well. <laughs> it's typical, isn't it? For some reason, I can't. It's like there's something stopping me getting into fifth and sixth. But first, second, third, and fourth feel immense. The gearbox feels so tight now. I'll check back with you in a few minutes and let you know why I can't get fifth and sixth. So here is what was getting in the way. There's this little stud which pokes out of here, which this attaches to. So what I did, I've moved this kind of retaining plastic bit up the sleeve a bit further and onto this one which isn't being used and now I'm going to cut this one off I think. Not sure if that's what you're supposed to do but that's what I'm going to do. So now I'm going to test it before I put it back together to see if I've learnt my lessons so we can get first, second, third, fourth, fifth and sixth. That's better now. Let's just double check reverse. That's all gravy and we can see why it was catching down there. I'm 90% sure that's what you've got to do, but I may have just done it in a much more ghetto way. I probably should have just used a hacksaw or something, but life goes on. And all back together for the second time, so we're getting all the gears. That's definitely one of those mods where like, the idea of doing it is worse than actually doing it. And now I know, and you know, that that little stud's going to get in the way. It's going to make it a hell of a lot easier for you to install on your i30N if you have one. But my modifying itch hasn't been fully scratched, so the next thing to go in is some new sequential tinted wing mirror indicators. So after I'd removed the wing mirror cover cap and fitted the new indicator, that just clips back in and then it's on to the next part. Which is this snazzy RPM Performance N footrest plate, which just simply sticks on. So now I've itched my modifying bug, we can get back to some of the rebuild parts. And the next part to rebuilding up the front end, at least, is the headlights. So, well, the one from the driver's side did survive the crash, luckily. I've just had to pick up another one for the passenger side, which is just here. So we can bolt these up and see if they're going to work. Hopefully it does. Now, some of the wiring on the passenger side has been damaged. That would be this stuff here. So this is for like the DRL and the parking sensors. But unfortunately, there has been some minor damage on the headlight plug as well. The wires do still all go into the plug and the core of the plug is still there. So I'm hoping it still works, but I will be repairing that at a later date. So we can plug in the headlights, but unfortunately it doesn't make the same satisfying click as it secures onto the back of the light, but it will do for now. And then to bolt it up, there's just a 12mm at the top nearer the windscreen and two 10mm lower down the car towards the bumper. So now the real question is, are those headlights working? So we need to start her up. Let's flick that on there. That one's working as we'd expect. And yes, we've got the passenger side as well. That's looking sick. Now on these cars, the indicators are in the bumper, in the DRLs, which might partially justify the £1,000 price tag of those. But all we've got on here is a side light and a dip beam and a full beam. So that's all we need to make sure is working. And I think we're looking all good. And the next part of this which has seen better days is the bonnet. Now the main damage is actually here on this corner where it's folded, but it is rippled really badly across the top here. So it's probably just gonna be cheaper to replace this. So to take this off, again, there was two 12 mils on each side which hold the bonnet to the hinges. 
Now, if you're changing bonnet on a crashed car, chances are too, you'll need to change the hinges as well, because even if they're only bent by a tiny bit here, by the time that's down here, that can put panel gaps off by like an inch. So we'll change these over for new ones as well. And to access the bolts for this, I've got to take off the scuttle panel. So that means taking off the windscreen wipers and then a few clips and then we can shimmy that out of place and then we can get to the bolts for those hinges. So there's two 12 mils just down there which are underneath the skull to take off and then once those are off the hinges will come off the car and I can replace them with these second hand but undamaged hinges off a car the same colour so I haven't even got to paint them. Winner! So we can get those hinges unbolted from the car and get them replaced with the new ones but before I did that it only seemed right to give it a proper clean up under here because I couldn't believe how dirty it was. It was full of leaves and mud and all sorts of stuff but once that was cleaned up I could then get the bonnet hinges on and then we can see how the bonnet's going to fit. Okay, hinges are on and I've gave a little clean up underneath the scuttle panel as well because it was a bit grim and I have got a new bonnet here ready to go on. It is slightly the wrong shade of blue but let's see how it fits. So we get the new bonnet bolted into place and, well, the fit isn't horrendous. It's not too bad. There's still a bit of work which needs to be done on the panel gaps, but there's no point getting too hearty about the panel gaps because it's all going to have to come back off in the future anyway. So then we can refit the windscreen scuttle and the windscreen wipers and move on to the next stage. So progress is looking pretty good. We've got most of the front end on now and working as it should it seems. But there is one more thing we can do before that front bumper goes on. And that is sort out this bit of wiring here. Well, we can sort it to the best of our ability. I've managed to get one of these plugs uh, from someone else who's been rebuilding an i30N. This is for the DRL and the indicator in the bumper and luckily all of the wire colours match what we've got here so that's nice and easy. And then we've got three wires here for the parking sensors I believe. Now unfortunately I don't have the plug for that but I have got some, well, OEM spec cable in the exact same colours which is going to help me. So I'm going to extend these and then leave these hanging until I decide exactly what I'm going to do with those. And because I don't have a soldering iron or much equipment for electrical stuff really, but I want to do this in the best possible way, I'm going to use these connectors which have solder inside them and also heat shrink. So what you do with these is you strip the wire back, put both ends inside, heat up the centre of it so the solder melts and then the heat shrink shrinks around both of the wires and waterproofs it and that is it done. It couldn't get much more simple than that. All I've got to do is repeat this six times for the DRL and indicator and then another three times to extend the wires for the parking sensors. Once that was done, I then reused the original trunking off the damaged wiring to give it that completely OEM look and then wrapped it in electrical tape to match the rest of the loom. I am happy with that repair. If you didn't know it was done, then you wouldn't know if that makes sense. But yeah, progress is looking good. Bonnets on, the wings on, the headlights are in and we're missing one last crucial piece, the front bumper. Now I've managed to pick this up for what I think is a pretty decent price. So I've got a complete front bumper, that's parking sensors, the DRLs, which is supposed to be a thousand pound each from the main dealer, all the foam sections on the back, the wiring loom, everything. And I got that in a package bundle with the passenger headlight and the rad pack as well for a total of £2,000. So for the price of two of the DRLs, I got all of that, which I think is a pretty good deal. Now, because it's come pre-assembled, we ain't got to mess around with putting any of this on. It literally should just fit straight to the car. And I can't for the life of me see how it properly fastens because all of the holes which line up on the bumper just look like they're holes for clips. There isn't anywhere to actually bolt the bumper into. And it's the same story on the wheel arch side as well. There's nothing. It's just clip holes. What's going on? Let's just get it on the car and see what happens. So now we can look at fitting up the final piece to the face of the i30N. It feels like it was only a couple of weeks ago where I had this car delivered as a wrecked mess that could hardly even make it off the back of the recovery truck. So words can't describe how great it feels to finally be at this stage, but also to have took you guys along the journey with me. But I'd be lying if I said I was completely happy with the result. Although I'm happy we've brought this car back to near its former glory, apart from a bit of paint and a bit of fettling, but I think this car has so much more potential than just that. It's so easy to get lost in the world of YouTube where buying another car on top of another car is the best thing to get more views. But I don't want to lose sight of my passion and what I enjoy and that's building and owning cars which are individual. Ones where it takes a true petrol head and blood and sweat and tears to build them from scratch. But we couldn't do that with a wrecked mess of a car 
but I think we have now just about sorted that. So there we have the front bumper fitted and, well, sort of fitted. I need to go and grab some more clips. There is only clips that hold it across the top here and in the arch liners. The only bolt I can find which goes into it is the one that goes up through here into the wing. Apart from that, everything's clips. Which does surprise me and seem a little bit scary, but it seems pretty solid now. But we do have another quick job to do. So now the final piece to go on to the bonnet and the assembly is just about complete. But I know there's going to be some of you in the comment section thinking, well, why have you put it together when the car obviously needs painting or wrapping at some point? Well, let me tell you, there's reason behind every single thing that I do, even if some of them are a bit stupid. Although what we've done up to this day is a big achievement, you really want to make sure you subscribe because for this project, let me tell you right now that this is only just the start. So today is the day that we've been building up to with the i30N because ever since I've got this car, I've never planned on leaving it standard. And you may have got the hints from the previous videos, but we have actually got a... Hello? Chris, mate, you've got to do something about that i30N. It sounds shocking, mate. That's a bit harsh, but I have got some bits to make the i30N sound a bit better, and it sounds like Ben wants to help out. And by the way, I promise we'll come back to that other bit soon. We've actually come to Warrington and had the car trailered here to the home of the boys at Evil GT. Welcome up north, mate. And we're gonna be doing something today to play with the sound of the Hyundai i30N. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. And there's a few ways in which we're gonna do that, the first of which being this. A Scorpion turbo back exhaust. Now, out of the box, the Hyundai i30N is definitely not the worst sounding car. It's got a exhaust which pops and bangs with all sorts of cool stuff but a scorpion one is gonna be better that is a big old package you got there mate it is <laughs> but before we start even looking at taking the factory exhaust off I think we've got to do a sound check so we can compare it to later in the video to see how the new one sounds I mean, for a factory exhaust, that don't sound too bad. Rate it out of 10. That is already pretty as well. That's a strong 7.5 out of 10. Strong 7.5. I'm not even sure if that is the factory exhaust because I've never had a proper look underneath the car, so maybe we should check it out right now. So starting at the back, this is definitely a factory back box. It is. Um, we can go a little bit further towards the engine. This all looks factory to me. Right, okay. That looks factory. Yeah. You factory. Know what you're looking at. I have no idea. I'm mate. saying that is not factory. That doesn't look factory to that's me. That's not factory at all. No. That is a GPF delete, that is. So that explains the Asbo pops and bangs and it definitely does. it's quite loud. It definitely does. So we may not get as much of a difference as what we first thought, but maybe that does answer it. Yeah, that answers that question. And then we don't really know what's up here. It could have a decap. I can't really see, so I can't really tell. Incredible insight for you there. <laughs> I think the first thing that we should do is spray something on all these bolts some penetrating solution, so that's I step one. Penetration. There you go, mate. Only yeah. the best in this garage. Is that high quality penetrating solution? It is. The rubbers, to make them easier to get off. If that works, I'm gonna do the bolts. Uh, I uh, anticipate they're gonna be the easiest ones. So I think we're gonna crack this one off by taking the exhaust off in sections, starting at the back, working forwards. Benji, are you ready? Born ready, me, mate. Um, what I'll be good at, though, is holding the camera for you whilst you crack on. Is Fantastic, right? mate. That's all I needed. So we start removal of the bat box by taking off the two 14mm nuts which hold the bat box to the midsection. There is also a exhaust valve to unplug on the driver's side and also the two rubbers which actually hang the exhaust from the car. Waiting for Then it was time for the midsection itself. Two 14mm nuts held that to the GPF delete, which is at the front of the car, and then again, two rubbers, and then we can get that off the car as well. Now the GPF delete was a little bit tricky to undo just because it was attached to the flexi and would remove the rest of the exhaust already, so it probably would have been easier to break these nuts off first. But with a bit of teamwork, we got them cracked off and got that removed off the car as well. Now the next bit is a little bit tricky for you guys to see. So what we've got up here is the flexi section and to unbolt that from the downpipe, there's two nuts 
which hold it on a similar flange up right by the engine and to get to this we had to use a whole collection of extensions on a ratchet to even get near them so it wasn't the easiest thing to get to definitely but with ben positioning the socket and me delivering the muscle power we eventually got them cracked off and got the flexi section removed too i've just done a cracking job <laughs> we already have our first casualty i lowered the ramp down onto the cannon it's the only one we got so i can't believe that do you want one Oh, I love that. Do you know what? That actually looks decent. It does, yeah. It? It's good pour. So in just less than an hour, we managed to get all of the parts of the exhaust off apart from the downpipe. Which is probably where things are going to get a little bit trickier. <laughs> What do you reckon, Mill Mush? Well, there's not much room back there's there. There's not, no. There, let's be honest. Um, and looking from underneath. Let me make some more room. Ah, there we go. Well, that's cracked it then. I don't know what it is. Worried about. I'm assuming you've got to take this heat. Why is it still so hot under here? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, let's get these heat shields off, I reckon, and then yeah. we can diagnose the situation from there. What do you want there, Dallas? 10 mil? Um, I think that is a 10 mil, yeah. I think it is. So armed with the 10 mil, we can start taking off the bolts which hold the heat shield to the turbo and also remove things like the lumbar sensor, which we're going to need to remove later to get the downpipe off as well. This servo is mounted slightly differently to what you'll see on most road cars because it's like a top mounted turbo so the turbo sits right up by the bulkhead near the top of the engine bay where most that you'll see will sit further down more towards the bottom which does make it easier to access certain parts of it but also means that the downpipe is going to be longer and therefore more tricky to remove. Right, there is a heat shield bolt in what I can see as the most stupid place. Do you, want, do you want to show them where it is, Ben? Well, I'd love to, mate, but I can't see it myself. It's underneath. It's underneath this bit of the, the block. Just, I can't even get my hands to it, but... So I put a finger on it? Yeah, yeah, okay. it's down there. It's... Well, <laughs> yeah. It's that bit that pokes out directly underneath that. How the hell are you supposed to get anything on that? I can't think of a good answer. No idea, mate. I don't. How about this? Yes, bend it out. That is definitely. Ah. Nice yeah, we'll leave it where it is. Okay. How brave are you feeling? Not very, to be honest with you, because to get these off can be a nightmare. We've got these four bolts for the downpipe onto the turbo left to take off, and I think maybe a bracket down the bottom, which sounds super easy, but the problem that I've heard is that. That's what I do. So the problem that I've heard is that these are really prone to snapping, so I've drenched it in high quality penetration fluid. Yeah. And. Cut. Magic yeah, a full cup, pretty much. It's all inside the downpipe now and everything. The other thing we can do is get them hot, but apart from that, if they snap, then that means taking the turbo off to then repair it, which I don't want to do. Do you want to do that? I don't want to do that, mate. Me neither. So it seems we have one chance to get these downpipe bolts out because if we get it wrong, it makes the job so much bigger. So we start by getting an idea of how tight the bolts are and then going straight for the trickiest one around the back at the bottom. There's no way this is the correct way of doing it, but we have two extensions, a wobbly socket, and a deep reach 14. And it seems to just about be working for the, like, the most awkward bolt. The other ones seem like a doddle compared, but I might have just jinxed it. <laughs> Thankfully, I didn't jinx it. That one did come out, so then I could start taking out the other three, and then that was the downpipe unbolted from the turbo, and we can go back underneath the car. So, that was a bracket, mate. It's around the other side. Yeah, how the... F Oh, I can see one of them. How the well, I can see him, I can see him. Can you? Yeah. You can just make it. I'm going to put an arrow on the screen now, so you guys can see it. Well, ben can't. I was going to say, I'm glad you, like, lot can see it, because I can't. And you can just about make them out, there you go, just through there. So we're going to go, instead of going up through the back of the subframe, we're going to go up through the middle of it. Much easier. Much easier. So once we'd figured out how to get to those downpipe bracket bolts, we then went up through the subframe and with a couple of extensions and a wobbly socket and a bit of teamwork again, managed to get the socket on there and crack those bolts off. I'm not sure if this is the correct thing to do, but I heard that you have to drop the subframe to be able to get the downpipe off, so that's what we started doing. It was quite easy to do. There was a couple of brackets which we had to remove and then four bolts which actually bolt the subframe up into the car. We didn't actually want to take this off. We just wanted to drop it down by an inch or two just to give us a little bit more room to play with in order to get the downpipe out from the engine bay. And this seemed to do exactly the trick. We managed to give us that little bit more room to play with so we could get a bit of access to the lower lumbar sensor. So once it unbolted that, that gave us loads more room to play with and then we could finally get it out. <laughs> yep, yep. How are we looking? Yes! We are looking. I can see the head. <laughs> yeah!
There you go, mate. Hold that above your head with pride. What? What an absolute job. If anybody asks again, um, do either of us want to do a um, I down pipe? And down pipe? I reckon we could do that in two hours now, you know. Do you reckon? Yeah, I wouldn't want to though. <laughs> I've got to say a massive thank you to the guys at Scorpion for sending me out this turbo back exhaust. How kind is that of them? But now me and Ben are going to have another fight with the car and try and get this down pipe on. Let's go! So this was the exact opposite of what we did in the first place, it's downpipe in first, we went up through the bottom, again with a bit of wrestling, it wasn't the easiest thing to get into place but we could get that bolted up, up top. And once that was in, we could plug in the second lamber sensor which we had tightened up when the downpipe was halfway up towards the top and we can put in the pre-cat lamber as well. And then it was back underneath to tighten up those tricky downpipe bracket bolts too. Once that was fastened in, we could then put in the flexi section and Ben must have been feeling pretty accomplished. You'd like some sort of, um, a, you know, award and that. You mean like a certificate? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I can get one in the post to him in the future or something, but he's got that in place and sat on the rubbers and the studs and then it was my turn to get in there with a couple of extensions and a wobbly socket and get it tightened up. After that it was time for the OPF section which in this Scorpion exhaust has got a resonator in there too. You can opt not to have the resonator but as I've learned from my BMW I don't want it too loud. Things you claim that I like, you can say Ooh, that was satisfying. It was nice, weren't it? And from here, the exhaust really just fell into place. It was the midsection to go in, which is just held in with a clamp and a hanger, and then it was onto the back section, including the back box as well. One thing I really like is the look of this exhaust, because you can see the polished stainless steel back boxes whilst the car's on the floor, which I think looks really good. Once everything was in place, Ben just went around all of the clamps and tightened those up to make sure we weren't going to get any knocks or rattles. Now we have most of the exhaust on, including the back box. It is now time. Ben's favourite bit. What? Putting the tip in. <laughs> These snazzy new massive tips, which definitely do pass the fist test, which should fit on there. Something like that. So while the lads were fitting up the tip on one side, I transferred over the active exhaust valve from the original exhaust into the Scorpion one, which means we're going to be able to retain the active exhaust flap in this aftermarket exhaust, which is wicked. And Ben very kindly fit that up for us as the final piece of the exhaust, but we still had more work to do the next morning. So it is nearly 10 a.m. Chris is absolutely nowhere to be seen. So I've decided to crack on with this Hyundai myself. Put these back on. So these bits, I don't even know what they do, but they obviously bolt to the subframe and over here to the actual sill. So they're all bolted up. This bit of heat shield is bolted up too. So that's all done. Hey, Mush. Afternoon, Princess. Where are you? I'm just in Starbucks. Good morning. Nice evening. Morning? Morning? It's morning somewhere. Are you joking? Nice of you to join us, mate. Well, I thought I'd come and make your day a bit better and bring you... Ah, oh, what a guy. Thank know, you very yeah. much, I nearly mate. got him to write bay on it for you, but <laughs> we didn't quite. Thanks very much. Right, listen, whilst you've been giving it Zs, um, I have lambda sensors in, um, heat shields are all on, bolted correctly, yeah, give them a touch. Bits underneath are done as well. You're phenomenal. Well, what else are you putting on it? Ask me about what I've got. What have you got? Well, funny you should ask that. Come over <laughs> here. A company called Race Chip have sent me some go faster bits. So this is a plug-in tuning box for the i30N. That's what we want. Hey, this looks all right. I know, yeah, it's the part, this. I'll be honest with you, I don't know, because I haven't opened it yet. This is the first time I've opened it, so we're opening it together. So I'm guessing that plugs in somehow. Okay, oh, there you go. <laughs> I know how to use those. <laughs> We're gonna figure this out in about four seconds and somehow I'll turn my car from 270 brake yeah? into 300. Ooh. Yes. I think I've got the gist of it anyway. And that goes into there and this plugs around in, in, in there, there somewhere. somewhere. Yeah. And okay. then we just make it look all neat. That's what I think. I might be wrong. Installing this was actually a little bit less complicated than it actually looks. Essentially, you just plug the loom in between 
three sensors on the engine and run those into the box and then took that box away somewhere nice and neat. So it's actually pretty easy. So we've got three main tuning settings on the performance box. We've got Eco, Sport and Race. Ben, which one are we going to pick? Race, obviously. Thank you very much. Race it is. So now we have changed the sound and the flow of the exhaust. We have increased the performance, but we have got a pretty janky intake at the moment. Even though this is Lamborghini certified, it needs upgrading. So we have had a package delivered from Forge. And in here... Do you want me to do the honours, yeah, mate? Yeah, please. I appreciate it. So this is a Forge Motorsports induction kit for the i30N. So we've got a much beefier intake part here. Ooh. That's, she's a beast. That is a nice cone. But that pops onto the end of there. I guess so, yeah. And then we're good to go. All right, mate. Well, over to you. I thought you wanted to do this bit. I'm doing it. Brilliant. So once I'd removed the factory intake pipe, I could then replace this with the new Forge Motorsport one. This bolts into place under one of the clips for the engine cover and then slips on with the silicon joiner. Then all we had to do is reattach a few of the hoses which linked onto that intake pipe, tighten everything up and then fit up that absolutely mahoosive air filter. Now I know some of these open air filter kits are a bit controversial and there is a little bit of debate to how much benefit they actually have but one thing they do is give you lots of cool turbo noises so you can't complain at that. Now as we've seen earlier I did actually have a resonator delete or an OPF delete pipe already fitted on the car that's why it's a little bit louder and I now have no purpose for this so I'm going to give it away to one of you guys by doing a post on my Instagram go check it out just here and win yourself some pipes so that's the induction kit now fitted to the i30n and I think that should really change the way the car drives and sounds as an overall package but there is only one way to find out so let's go for a drive that's your key but we'll pretend it's the i30 key <laughs> Let's see Thanks how it does. So Benji's in the passenger... You're in the driver's seat actually, aren't you? I am. You are in the driver's seat because you're driving. So I, mean, I want to know what your thoughts are on the car. Well, I've not, I've not like... Obviously, I've not kicked its head in yet. But I have got to say, straight away, the steering feels nice. Like, really responsive. There's no play in the steering or anything. That's good. I quite like that. The yeah. gearbox feels good. It's quite nice and tight. Similar to the uh, the focuses, actually. Okay. Um, the one thing I am conscious of is that we are on plastic tyres. No, 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 we've got one Michelin, so we know we're good. Oh, which corner was that? Uh, one of them. So this one, this one, this one. <laughs> so we're good if we're turning, say, right. Yes, yeah, yeah, right okay. corners. We're we'll... roundabouts are banging. Right, brilliant. Okay. But yeah, otherwise, quite like this. Where's race? <laughs> Hey, it pulls, nice, that, <laughs> doesn't it? Love that little, uh, the little, the little red matching thing. It gets going. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> You're wearing me a bad name. <laughs> <laughs> but, Chris, what I have got to say is, I think you definitely need to get the car's tracking done, because as you can see, it pulls to the right, we're on the wrong side of the road there. So I've got some friends, Awesome GTI. Yeah. Because you're a friend of mine, mate. They will welcome you with open arms. Ah, uh, me casa, su casa. So here we are at Ben's second home, and I feel a bit out of place because, well, it's it's all vag stuff, isn't it, mate? It's, it's vag stuff this it's your side. Your kettle of fish. BMW that side. That's right, a bit okay. more you. Isn't this it? is more me. Yeah. This is more where I belong. Hopefully, they can straighten out the way this car drives. So the boys pulled the i30N onto their state-of-the-art tracking ramp. What this does is analyzes what direction each of the wheels are pointing on the rear and the front of the car compared to factory specifications, and then they can do minor adjustments to change that and transform the way the car drives. Surprisingly, even though the damage was mainly on the front on the i30N, the actual tracking of the car is isn't too bad, all things considered, as soon as I've just bolted everything up and hope for the best. It's not, you look hoping for green, green is good, red is bad, there ain't too much red, so hopefully it should track up pretty nice. So after a small adjustment to the front and rear of the car, the car was all set up ready to go. Right, Chris from the future here, I just realised I completely forgot to do a before and after on the exhaust, so here is how it sounded before. And this is what it sounds like now, as best as I can mirror the environment. I'm 
I'm sure some of you will prefer how it sounded before and some of you will prefer how it sounds now. Personally, it, I think it sounds absolutely carnage now. It's definitely going to suit the future plans that we've got for the car. But anyway, back to the video. So the Geo is now sorted and we are all in the green. And I think we've made a pretty good improvement on how the i30N was it's at the start of the video. Mate, absolutely. New intake, new downpipe, it's got more BHPs and it's tracked up. What more could you want? What more could you want? That is now officially awesome. So if you just mean you're moving up north now? No. Ever since I bought and rebuilt my crash damaged Hyundai i30N, I've been dying to do this to it. And I know what you're thinking, I lost the plot. Well, there is a little story behind all of this. When I was bidding on this car, I made a bet with my friend because I didn't think it was going to do that well on YouTube, whereas he was sure it was going to be a hit. So the bet was that if the first video on this car did over 100,000 views, then I would have to buy and fit a wide body to the car. And it looks like I lost the bet. No! Now thanks to you guys for supporting the channel and watching the first video on this car, I now have to go to Germany to pick up the body kit for it. So we are back at the Nürburgring, magically teleported from my garage, and we are sat here with Benji at the tail end of our trip, taking the BMW around the Nürburgring. And we now have to go and do a short drive two hours north to see a company which have built something especially for my i30N. And that two hour drive is now complete and that brings us down to prior design. Prior are a German company which specialise in the design and manufacture of aftermarket body kits for a wide variety of cars. Now I've got to say that some of these kits are nicer than others, but the one that I'm here for is the i30N wide body kit, which they did actually have one in the showroom, but I'm not going to show you that yet. Now, Uncle Benji took a liking to this kit, but he was curious whether I thought I could get mine as good as the one in this showroom. Honestly, probably not. <laughs> but we'll try our best. We'll see what we can do. So we picked up the body kit for the i30. I'm not 100% sure if this is going to fit because this is the splitter for that. And, well, we've got luggage in the boot as well. What are you thinking through there, Ben? I think we might about just get her in. You reckon? No. I'm in here. You in? I'm in, yeah. We're in. Yeah. That's in, yeah, that's the biggest bit. Happy days. Yeah, that's good. That's what do you reckon to the kit? Um, I mean that doesn't look like five thousand pounds there, does it? No, it doesn't. But uh, you know, hopefully it does when it's on the car, eh? Well yeah, well it might hopefully look something like one in there. So we very carefully loaded up the questionably packed body kit around the luggage which we already had in the car. Then all I had to do was pay my outstanding balance on the bill and then we can try and get the kit back onto home soil and get it onto my car. And now we've got the kit back home, we can take a proper look over what I've bought and see if I've wasted my money or not. Prior Design is the only company I'm aware of that make a wide body kit for the i30N and when you lay it out on the car it doesn't look like there's actually a lot here. But the kit does also come with a splitter, a spoiler and a diffuser but it is still a pretty expensive kit considering it's fiberglass. And with that being considered you expect it to fit pretty damn well. But with the current shape that my car is in I don't think any kit would fit well. I haven't pointed it out yet but here we go. So you can see we've got a massive panel gap on this side of the bumper where the car wasn't actually damaged. And as we get over to the other side, we can see that closes right up. I'm actually very happy with the side that we've repaired and the panel gaps for everything here. But on the driver's side, you can see, again, the bonnet doesn't quite line up right and nothing is just, it's just not quite sitting right, especially on this wing here. And I want to give myself the best chance of fitting that expensive body kit to my car the best possible way. And to do that, I've got to sort this out first. And here is where I'm gonna start. Now I've already changed the hinges over to a new pair which match the color of the car, but the bonnet just doesn't seem to be quite sitting right no matter how I play with it. So what I've done, I've gone and bought some brand new ones from Hyundai. We're gonna fit those up and fingers crossed they make it fit a little bit better than it is at the moment. So to do that, I've got to take off the windscreen scuttle and the wiper arms to be able to access the bolts for where the hinges mount to the body of the car. And then we can undo the bolts on there and also on the bonnet to replace the hinges one at a time. It's still not 100%, but it's definitely a lot better. I'm now going to start tackling the first corner for the wide arch, and that is going to be this passenger side front wing. I've taken the wing so it gives me an easier place to draw a template. Next thing to do, get the wheel off and get the wheel arch liner out. It always surprises me how little these arch lines are held in with. It's just a few screws and a few clips, and they just pop right out. 
So this is the first arch which I'm going to fit and like I said this is the passenger side front so you can see roughly where this mounts but the problem is until you cut the arch away you can't see exactly how it's going to go. So what I'm going to start by doing is cutting to this line here, the outer one, the, the, the bigger one out of the two and that should hopefully then give me enough to at least gauge how much of the car I need to cut away. I'm going to take the bumper off before I do it and then yeah it should give me a basis to work from since this is the first call that I'm doing. I don't want to balls it up. So before I can start chopping up my car, I've just got to pop the bumper off, along with any other trims which are going to get in the way. And now there's no turning back. So using an angle grinder, I can cut away the bit of the arch which I no longer need to make way for that wide body. And for those of you wondering how it feels to chop the arches off your car, well, it's not pretty, I'll tell you that for nothing. And by the way, if at this point you're watching this video and you're not subscribed, what are you playing at? Because look at the extents I'm going through to provide you with that finest quality entertainment. So go down there and whack on that subscribe button before this video's over. It's free. After I cut the arch for the first time, I realised I was a million miles off from where I needed to be. So I recut the arch more towards the outer edge of where it needed to be. And then this time round, it fit much better. So now you can get an idea of how this kit is going to look. It's definitely a lot more subtle than the 350Z kit that we fitted way at the start of the channel. I want you to leave a comment down below if you've been watching since then. And this kit is a lot more expensive than that, but you can see why when you go to push it up. Because with the 350Z one, you really had to fight to get it into place. But as you can see here, with very little pressure, it's really butting up nicely against the bodywork. So it kind of just sits really, really tight against the standard wing. Now, this means that you could, if you wanted to, I think, get away with just painting the kit and sticking it directly on without painting the other panels if you've got a straight car. But I think what I'm gonna do with this one when I come around to it is bond it, obviously, to the wing itself and then also smooth it in ever so slightly just to take away that ever so fine gap just there and it'll look a lot more, well, neater. So after I'd learnt my lessons from the first side that we'd cut away on the damaged side of the car, I could then turn my attention to the undamaged side and hopefully do this side a lot cleaner. But as you'll see very shortly, this side was a little bit more complicated for an unexplicable reason. Now one thing I wanted to do on both sides was make sure the cut was as nice as I could get it. I'm not the best with an angle grinder but I wanted to make sure it was as neat as possible so I just run round both of the cuts with this finger sander before hitting them with some etch primer just to protect the paintwork slightly. Right, it's the next morning and I've made a start on some of the next parts for the wide arch on the i30N. Mainly being getting some protective paint down on the wings where I've cut them so the bare metal doesn't start corroding. I am going to use something more after the primer to then protect it further. And the next part I need to do is the bumper. So this is the piece here which fits on the bumper and it goes somewhere around around there, I think. I think something like that. So what I need to do is cut away a section of the bumper itself, but I need to retain the vent just here. So luckily this one has already kind of snapped out of the rivet, but I'm going to drill that one out there and these two out here, and then I can remo remove these vents cut away what I need to cut away and then we can look at bonding the arch extensions onto the bumper and also the car itself. So it's not that it's particularly technically challenging but it's just knowing that once you cut it there is no going back so there's no second chances. So I start by very carefully drilling out the rivets which hold this little vent in place splitting my time between the two to keep the plastic nice and cool and to stop it melting. So then we can mock it back onto the car and use the arch which we're going to mount on the wing to help us position the extension which goes on the front bumper too. It's And once that's in place, we can then put a line on where we need to cut and get it back off the car and start chopping. So I want to be a little bit less aggressive on the bumper than I was on the wings because this is plastic. I think I'm going to go in with a Dremel with a little cutting disc 
and just go just past this line which should then hopefully give me enough room to be able to slot on the over fender and then I can get it bonded on and lined up with the wings as well. So I start to hack away at the bumper and take away the section that I need to remove in order to fit the arch extension and because this is plastic it cuts super easy but there was a little bit of a knack to getting this to fit right because I had to trim some extra material off the top where it would meet the wing normally. But with a bit of trial and error, we got there in the end and now that new piece is sitting much more flush and then we can just tidy it up with that little finger sander and then turn our attention onto the other side. Now I wanted to keep these vents in the bumpers functional too so I had to trim away a bit of the overarch in order to allow that vent to sit into it. So now we can pop the bumper back on the car and then we can start looking at pushing forward with this body kit. So here is now where I'm up to. I'm ready to start bonding on the arches and the bumper kind of extensions which go here. And this is where fiberglass kits really do let themselves down sometimes because say for example on this side, it all fits really well and nicely. And it looks like it's gonna line up pretty well with the arch. But if we take a trip around to the other side of the car, it is not looking so good. So when I try and line this side up, this, is what I've got. I either have a big gap here and have this piece down here way off or well there is just no it just won't line up basically that's the closest it will be kind of just about there <laughs> but that is that is not acceptable and then if I'm to position it how the other side sits then the gap is like that so with that being the case I'm going to start easy on myself and do this side and then work my way up to doing that side I think and so we can start sticking the body kit to the car, but first we just scotch the area to make sure the glue is going to adhere as best as possible. Now, if you're wondering what glue I'm using, I'm actually going to be using Tiger Seal to hold this kit on. And I know that might sound crazy, but hear me out. When using panel bonds and things like that, they actually tend to dry really brittle, which means they do have a habit of snapping and not necessarily being the strongest choice for something which is going to need a little bit of flex in it. Along with that, panel bond will be really expensive in the amounts that I'm going to need to bond this kit on. And that is exactly the reason why I've chosen Tiger Seal. One, it's super strong. Two, it's super cheap. And three, it allows a little bit of flexibility, meaning that the kit should hopefully not snap off. But I suppose we'll see later in the video whether it does stay on or not. So once the kit's stuck in place, I'm just gonna hold it temporarily on with duct tape for now and leave that to dry. Okay, I think after a bit more looking, I've found that the arch itself, which goes around here, is actually okay. That seems to line up quite well with the, you know, the panel gap just here, but it seems to be this piece that's the problem. It doesn't quite want to sit, you know, in its home exactly right. Like when you line it up like that, it looks fine, but, you know, it's sort of not lining up there. In there is okay, but, yeah, when you try and line up with the actual arch itself, it's not it. So I'm going to fit the arch first and use that to then line this up. And then worst case scenario, I think what I can do is, you know, refiber that or sand down part of this to make the gap more even. So we've now got the passenger side arch stuck and taped into place so we can now see what's going on with this front bumper piece and after this fit now I think I can see where the problem is. There's too much material at the top where the that extension meets the wing extension and that needs sanding down which I then did and it made it fit much much better. So now we can get that stuck on and then finish off any last bits we want to do to that at a later date. So I'm reasonably happy with the way that's looking. We'll see properly when we take the tape off. I can see there is an ever so slight lip just there facing. You know, this bit sticks out slightly more than this bit. But when it goes to paint, we can try and finesse that a little bit. Just make it a little bit, you know, smoother. But apart from that, pretty happy with it. Just taking a bit of material off here really helped it out. Now, while this is drying, I'm going to have a look at the arch liners. Because one thing with a lot of wide body kits is you do tend to lose a decent arch liner or you have to chop it up or make something completely custom. But I'm hoping with this one, I don't have to. And that's because the inside of the arch is kind of tucked into where the old arch would be. So that means I'm hoping I can tuck the wheel arch liner back into place and then just use the fiberglass of the arch as the rest of the arch. I may have to do some kind of messing around with it just to get it to fit nice and maybe a little bit of trimming or a bit of heating but nothing too mad compared to what you have to do on other body kits because this one's not too extreme. So it's now the next day and hopefully the glue is dry so we can pull this tape off and see how it looks. I'm stolen. 
How good does that look? Now, not only is the fitment of the kit pretty nice, but as I said, I will be smoothing the gap, but it is absolutely rock solid. There's no way I could pull that off there. And once I've then, again, as I said, filled in, smoothed in the gaps, there may be the odd area where I can maybe get a little bit more glue in there, but you know, it's rock solid. That's just the bumper loose because I haven't tied it in yet, but yeah, that ain't going anywhere. And even the panel gap remains nice. So that's the original panel gap for the car and it remains about the same on the body kit too. So it's looking good. Well, I like it anyway. I realize a wide body isn't everybody's cup of tea, but I think this one is gonna look good. This side on the other hand is like I said, not perfect. As you can see, there is a slight lip here which does need sanding down before I can paint it. And it just needs a little bit of fettling just to get it exactly how I want it. Now I do still need to find a solution for the arch liners. Even though they are back in, they are not quite fitting right because obviously the new arch sticks out further and I need to find a way to get the original arch liner to kind of fit to the new wider arch. So I think it's gonna need some relief cuts and some extra material putting in and hopefully then that'll be okay. But it's not a million miles off. Right, next up is to sort out the only bit of interior damage that we've got in the car. And that is on the steering wheel. As you can see, there's a slight rip all the way down the left-hand side, which is a bit ugly. Now, this is the perfect time to upgrade the interior and change that, but I don't want to lose my Herod steering wheel function, which if I went for like a carbon fiber wheel, I would. But I've got a solution so I can keep the heated steering wheel and trim this a little bit nicer. And that comes from the guys at Wheel Finesse. So they have sent me out a whole load of goodies along with a new steering wheel cover for the i30 now color wise i've gone for something which well i didn't intend to originally i've gone for a red stripe with white stitching and you might be thinking i've lost my mind because the original stitching here is blue but we can't match that color throughout the car there is red and white in other areas so on the mats on the brake calipers and also on the wing as well for now so like i've said before sometimes a contrast is the best way to do it rather than getting a bad match do something that's completely different then it can't not match Make sense? So this is a DIY kit, but very kindly, Tom from Wheel Finesse, say hi Tom, guys. has <laughs> offered to come up and fix this to the car for me to make sure I don't get it wrong. So Tom sets about sticking and stitching the new wheel cover onto the Hyundai steering wheel with a little supervision from the goodest boy in town. These steering wheel covers are a really good, quick, cheap alternative to getting a whole new wheel made because you can do it within a couple of hours without even taking your steering wheel off the car. And how much better does that look? Not only have we covered over the tears in the leather, but we've also customized it with this perforated leather on the side, the Alcantara at the top, the red stripe, the white stitching, which goes with all of my dashboard, as you can see here. Ties it in with the red and the white on there. It's just sick. Now, if you want to grab yourself a wheel finesse a steering wheel cover, they make them for all sorts of cars, not just high and so go to their website and you can configure your steering wheel cover on there with all sorts of colors and materials too. And use discount code SLICKS and that's gonna save you a tasty 15% off your new steering wheel cover. Just so you know, they are DIYable, but they also do offer a fitting service as well, so you can do it yourself or pay someone else. So now we can get back on with this body kit. As we know, the front arches are on and they are rock solid. But now we have wider arches, we've got to figure out how much wider the wheels need to be. And as you can see, it's gonna be by quite a bit because the standard wheels now sit really far inside these arches and look a bit lost. So now to figure out how much wider my new wheels need to be, I need to measure my old wheels all the way out to the arch to then calculate how much extra width or offset my new ones are gonna need. It's about 12 inches. 
So I'd say on the front, I'm gonna need about an extra 40 centimeters of width on each side to get the wheels to sit flush with the arches. On the rear, I'm not so sure. We're gonna to have to fit those up in a minute. Now you might be wondering, is all of this worth it just to fit some wider arches? The fact you've then gotta have the whole car painted, you've gotta get new wider wheels, new tires. It does become a really expensive process, but wide body cars just are on another level. If it be a factory wide body like a Yaris GR or a BMW M3 with the wider rear arches or something aftermarket like this, I just think it takes it to another level. And yes, in some cases it will make the car drive worse, but in some cases it's the opposite effect. It just depends how the car's set up and how wide that kit is. Oh, and I had also forgot to mention we have actually had the car tuned on a dyno now. <laughs> I think it made around 310 brake horsepower. I was going to mention it at some point, but the footage just doesn't line up with the video. So here's what it made. It's good, drives loads better, and the pops and bangs, if anything, are a bit more prominent than they were before as well. So thank you to the guys at Mallory Performance for doing that. But anyway, enough waffle, the front arches are done. Now I've got to look at the back arches. Rear arches are more complicated than the fronts because they're a double layer. So that means that we've got to weld up the gap so that no water gets in and then the car doesn't corrode and start falling to bits. So I suppose let's not waste any more time. Let's get this car finished. And with so much to do in this video, we have no time to waste. So we crack straight on with preparing the paintwork. Now with most of the original panels on this car, they're in pretty good shape, so we can get away with just doing a good scotch on those and they're good to go. But there is a few minor chips and a couple of little bits which we'll need tidying up, especially on the second hand panels, because we want to make sure that if this does chip, it doesn't show through the previous colour, so we want to make sure the paint sticks as best as possible to these areas. But in the grand scheme of things, the car's in pretty good shape, so it doesn't take too much to get those panels ready. We do want to make sure that we pay special attention to the edges of panels because any poor prep work here will lead to paintwork peeling off the car, which is the last thing that we want. And in order to make preparing those edges easier, along with making masking easier, we remove any trims and any badges which are going to get in the way. But we can't do too much with the rear quarters until the arches are on, so we really need to start sizing those up and see how they're going to fit on the car. And to do that we need to get a good idea of where the arch is going to sit, so we can place it roughly on the panel and gauge where that goes, and then we need a little bit of space underneath that to be able to bond it to the panel too. But as you'll see later in the video, this step is not as simple as we first thought. So prep is well underway. We've got most of the body now sanded because the parts of the car which were undamaged are perfectly straight and the new panels, there is only one dent which is on the bonnet, which is right here, which we either need to get pulled or filled. So that means that I can't put off doing the rear arches any longer. That really is the next job. And to do that, I've got to get the rear bumper off which on an i30N is actually pretty easy. All you've got to do is take the rear lights out with these two bolts and unplug them, take out the clip which holds the bumper in here, the bolt which is here, and then you can, if you wish, whiz the rear wheel off to make this next step a little bit easier. Which is going to help you access these four screws in the wheel arch liner. And then there is four bolts which bolt the crash bar to the car itself which you've got to take off and then the rear bumper should be free from the car. After those are out all you've got to do is unclip the bumper but you've got to be careful here not to break the clips. Wow. And then the bumper should just jiggle off the car. I'm not going to lie to you guys, I was going to do that really cockily and say that's how you take off an i30M bumper, but I made a bit of a hash of it. Not only did I manage to stab myself and get red sauce everywhere, but I also managed to break my new bumper as well. So now I've got to figure out how to repair that so that clip holds solid. So yeah, nice one, Chris. Sometimes I amaze myself. The front wings weren't so bad because even if I do mess them up, it's a replaceable panel, so I can just take it off and start again, worst case scenario. But with a rear quarter, it's a slightly different story. Because if you cut away too much, it's either then a case of bodging it and welding it back into place or replacing the full quarter. And that's why there's some jobs which I trust myself to do and then some that I don't, like this one. 
And that's exactly why I've assembled a small team to get the car looking at its best in this video. We've got Tom who specialises in fabrication and Callum who does bodywork and painting. So like I said, when cutting this outer layer, we've got to be super careful not to damage the inside layer so we've got some material to work with afterwards to fill in the gap. So in order to fit these rear arches, we've got to establish exactly where we need them to go. And to do that, we've got to cut away the first layer. So we can get a rough idea of where the arch wants to go. And then we can start trimming it little bit by little bit. Now, because of the way that these arches fit, we need to slide them up into the rear quarter. So that means behind where we cut, we then need to make a lip which goes even higher than that to allow the new arch to fit into place. But once the first skin's cut, we can then start to see where the new arch is going to fit. But we did find something unexpected here. So we've just noticed on here, on the inside of the rear quarter, it's been written in like felt tip or something. It says V-Spec. Now I have no idea why that's been written there, but if you do know, please leave a note in the comments and let us know why. So the first skin is now cut. The second step is to cut the inner arch and cut it into fingers so we can push it and weld up the gaps. But while Tom's doing that, I'm going to start hacking up the rear bumper. There's two main reasons why we're doing it this way. One, it allows better fitment of the kit, and secondly, it allows more wheel travel. So if we ever do decide to lower the car more, then it's not gonna be a problem. So Tom gets those tack welded into place and then we can see exactly the shape that it's going to be taking. There's a few ways you can fill up the gaps. You can either fiberglass them or seam seal them, but we're going to weld it. So while Tommy's making great progress on the rear quarter, we are just outside at the moment preparing, well, a couple of bits. We've got the diffuser here, foiler here, and the splitter here. These two look pretty decent, really, but this diffuser, I'm going to be honest, it's... It's crap in there. <laughs> so it just looks like it was made in a completely different way, in a completely different location by completely different people because the standard of it in comparison is just awful. It's got lumps all over it. It's It looks like you'd expect a fiberglass kit to come that was much, much cheaper. So we're going to see what we can do with it, but I'm not 100% sure if it's going to make the car or not. We'll see how it is when it's painted. And I've also made the cuts for the extensions on the bumper as well. And I've also repaired this clip on the edge of the bumper by using a... You know, the plastic welding staples, so that is rock solid again now and good to go. So progress is looking good. At this point, Tom had finished welding up one of the sides so we can bond on the rear arch to the rear quarter. This is what's going to make that real wide look from the back. So we get it in position, locate it up in position with the side skirt and the back of the rear quarter and push it into place. Again, like on the front, it looks like this side is fitting really, really well, even though this is where the damage on the rear quarter was, it almost lined up perfectly. And once we were happy the rear quarter was stuck and in position, we could then line up the door extension to that, which is then going to complete the look of that arch. Now we've got a lot of the prep done on the car, we can now look at sealing the gaps on the panels from the body kit, which we've already bonded on. We just do this with the Tiger Seal again, smush it into the gap, you know, try and make a nice bead around it, push it in, and then we can wipe off the excess afterwards. And I'm really, really glad that we did this because it really filled in the gaps and made it look a lot, lot smarter and a much better fit. All we had to do was leave this overnight to dry and then we could come in the next morning and then peel off the tape from the rear arches and then start pushing forward with the project. So it's now the next day and here is where we're up to. We've got both of the front arches bonded on and also got the gap sealed as well, which is gonna add a bit of strength and also make it look better and make it fit better to the car. We have also got the back arch and door trim on this side. As you can see, same again, sealed the gap, haven't done the door one yet, but that arch is looking 
mad. <laughs> so now the car is getting very, very close to being ready for paint, but you'll be glad to hear that we're not gonna be painting it in here because, well, that'd be a stupid idea. So we need to get it back on all four wheels, get it back roadworthy, and we can go to somewhere which is a little bit more appropriate. And this is where we're gonna be painting it. So this is a booth which we managed to rent by the day, which works out a lot better than taking it elsewhere. But it's not the prettiest of booths in the world. It has been used and abused a little bit. So we've done our best to try and clean it up, getting rid of much of the dust, to try and minimize nibs and everything like that. We're just working with what we've got. Fingers crossed the result is gonna be worth it. So we can now get these bumpers in primer, but because of the unique way that this kit's designed, you have to bond the extensions to the unpainted part of the bumper. So that means we have to mask that off before we can prime it. So once we got those in primer, we then realised we actually messed up a bit because we hadn't fitted the extensions to the rear bumper, which is a real rookie error. So then we started to look at getting those on the car and to do that we had to trim back these bumper retaining brackets. So once we got those cut, we could then test fit the bumper and then also fit the driver's side arch so we can line up the arch extensions for the bumper. When that was fitted, we then had a fight for about two hours trying to get this bumper extension to line up nicely and it really didn't want to go into place. This side of the car, it wasn't it. Once we'd found the closest thing to its happy spot which lined up with the rear quarter, we then clamped that into place and then moved on to the passenger side, which took us the grand total of four minutes. While satisfied this side was a lot quicker as it was getting late, it really didn't add up. Wow, <laughs> make sense of that. I don't know. Do you know what? I'm not angry though. Are you angry? I'm not angry. I'm ready for bed. Yeah, I'm happy that that fits well. And then all we had to do was stick on the final pieces, so that's the door trim and also the final bumper trim. On this project with these guys, unfortunately, late nights and early mornings have turned into a regular thing, which they shouldn't be, but we have to get this finished and out of the door by Sunday, because on Monday, everyone comes back to work here and we haven't got use of the booth. What a night this has been. We've had such a fight trying to get the driver's side to line up on every single step of the way. It's been a nightmare. Every single piece is not quite fit right, apart from just that little tiny door extension. But on the passenger side, what we spent doing for three hours on one side took us five minutes on the other. It just doesn't make sense. Next day and we are back again and we are grafting away on the i30 and right now we're finessing the kit on the driver's side just to try and make it fit that little bit better because we've only got one shot to fit it and now we're going to start looking at the underside of the bonnet, get that painted, we can get that fitted back to the car and then the outside of it can be painted with the rest of the car. I've also sealed up the gap on the inside of the arch so that should help it not only hold stronger but also be more watertight and therefore last longer and we've also added a bit of material here on this edge and also on this edge of the bumper just here and that should just help close that gap up a tiny bit and hopefully make the kit fit 10 10 ish but that's just kind of how it is with these fiberglass kits they're never perfect they always need a bit of work it doesn't matter how expensive it is it's just how they are but they absolutely nailed one side so it is a bit of a shame they couldn't get it right on the other and before anyone says it's because the car's crashed well this is the crash side and this is the one that fits perfectly so the first thing to do today is take off the bonnet so we can paint the underside of that but first we've just got to scotch it and etch prime the hinges. Which was a pretty quick process, meaning we could get it straight in the booth, painted and back on the car ASAP. While we had access to it as well, we also just quickly painted the inside of the red wing because we're not gonna be able to get this when the bonnet's back on the car and the cars were being painted. So it's just better to be safe than sorry. And next in the booth is the diffuser, the splitter and the spoiler. You know, all the bits are going gloss black. So the gloss black bits are now painted and they're looking pretty good. The diffuser we're a bit unsure of. I think it might get a couple of coats of clear coat once this is cured just to finesse the finish a little bit, but overall pretty happy with that. And now it's on to the bumpers. So this one has already been primed. We need to prime the edges where we've stuck the extensions on and mask off the plastic at the bottom. This one has been primed already and already been sanded and is now just in the process of being masked off, ready for paint. So Callum smashes out the masking on that plastic section because obviously we want to keep that bit that colour as best as possible so it's very important we get this right. Then we can get that in the booth along with the other bumper and get those painted. Fire. 
and the bumpers are now in the booth. So we've got to get these painted and get these out so we can get the car in and get that painted tonight or in the morning. By that I mean early hours in the morning because we've got to be out of here Sunday night. Otherwise, well, I'm leaving with an incomplete car. So in order to make the most of our time, while Callum is putting the blue paint on the prime bumpers, me and Tom tackle the finishing prep parts on the body of the car. So that means giving it a blow off and getting it as clean as possible because the last thing we want is for dirt to contaminate the paint and cause us problems whilst painting the car. So there is the bumpers now painted, they've been primed, base coated and had the clear coat too and they are looking wicked. Might need a little flat and polish but overall very very happy with that. We need to get these out so we can get the car in ASAP. So we can swap out the bumper for the car itself and then start masking up and getting everything ready. We also wanted to make sure that we got well into the wheel arches so we also put the car on axle stands to make sure we have enough access under there too. You'd think with three people this wouldn't be a big job, but let me tell you, this took loads longer than what we expected. It seemed to take about two or three hours just to get the car in a condition where we could get some paint on it. And as you can see by this point, it's well past midnight and I am well and truly flagging, as both the other two lads were as well, but now the car is fully masked off and ready for some paint. I think we all needed a 3am McDonald's just to get us through this last final step. It's been a long night, but we've finally reached our goal of getting some paint on the i30N. We're just about to lay some primer on it, then we can do the base and then the clear, demask it and finally go home. Okay, so the car is now painted. It's light outside. It's gone five in the morning and I need my bed. Boys, what do you want to do right now? Get <laughs> I'll catch you in the morning. And it is now the next day and we may have woken up quite a few hours late, but we have now got the car unmasked and out of the booth. And how good does that look? Yes, it still needs flattening and polishing, I know, but it's so good to finally see the car in one complete color. And the car is looking top notch, but we have zero time to waste because I've got to be out of here today for everyone to continue their normal lives tomorrow morning. So we've got to get the bumpers back together, we've got to get them on the car, we've got to get the arch liners in, we've got to get, get the whole car finished off basically. Let's get on with it. So me and Tom start by reassembling the front bumper, but he agrees with me on this actually. This car is a real doddle to work on. It probably only took us five minutes to get this bumper back in one piece and then we could start on the rear bumper. I know I've said bumper a few times there. Now the eagle-eyed viewers of you will have noticed in this video that my parking sensor plug on the bumper was a bit dodgy, it just had some push connections and it's always been my intention to sort this, I just didn't have a three pin plug to do it. Now we've got one, now it's sorted. So 
So that's the rear bumper now back in one piece, but the final thing it needs is the crash bar clipping into place. I find it so strange how this crash bar is part of the bumper, not part of the car, but anyway, it is what it is. Next job, which is getting the door handles in. So it's just the clips around the edge and then putting the door handle in one bolt and done. Then it's back in with the rear lights, which you can access from inside of the boot, and then on with the wing mirrors. These are just three bolts and an electrical connector. It could not be any easier. Next up was the headlights, it's just three bolts while the car's in this shape, but while we were doing that, Callum had an ingenious idea. Because I wanted the lower parts and these inserts to match the lower plastics on the bumper and the side skirts, Callum told me to get this kind of satin black but plastic textured spray paint which we can use for that, and it actually tied in perfectly with the colour and the texture of this normal plastics. I like it, yeah, it just emphasises that, that vent more, don't it? This is good. So that means that the rear bumper is now done and can go back on the car. So now that paint's dry, we fit up the rear bumper, which like I said earlier, again, is super easy. And you can really see now how the car's gonna look from the back and how wide it's gonna look on the road too. So while Callum did that on the front bumper too, I then wet sanded and polished the rear spoiler, which we're gonna fit in a second as well. But if I do say so myself, I did a pretty good job on that. So now the spoiler's looking ship shape, we can now get that stuck on the car. Again, we just use Tiger Seal and a few clamps to hold it in place while that Tiger Seal dries. And then because Callum executed the bumpers so perfectly, it was then his job to do the side skirts as well. So while he was doing a cracking job of that, me and Tom tackled putting the splitter on the bumper. And to do that, we just tech screwed it in place and then replaced those tech screws with nuts and bolts with massive washers to try and spread as much of the load as possible. Now, some of the spots we couldn't quite get those bigger washers in, but Tom had the great idea of bending these into shape so they do fit. And now that the splitter's in place, we can then fit the front bumper to the car and we are really making some progress now. And I know now the car might look like it's just about done, but we're not there yet. There's still more to do. So to get these final finishing touches done, we pull the car onto the ramp. So now to fit the final piece of the kit, the diffuser. Now we weren't sure whether this is gonna make the car or not, but after a fair bit of sanding, I think we've got it acceptable. Considering how low down it is on the car, I think that is gonna look absolutely fine. So that slots on over the top of it goes a bit higher than that, doesn't it, mate? There we go. So that slot's just there, but it's just stuck on. So again, it's Tiger Seal. So we can load that up with our favourite substance from this video and then stick that to the car. But we weren't 100% confident in just Tiger Seal in this, so we didn't want the air to catch underneath it and potentially rip it off. So we put a few retaining screws underneath, which are just going to hold it that little bit tighter too. So after I got those in, the diffuser was on pretty tight, I can't lie, but I have got some ideas of what I want to do to this diffuser in the future to help it time better with the rest of the car, but we'll come back to that in another video. And the diffuser is now on, but we have three jobs left to do. The first one is installing retaining plates. Because we've removed some of the fixing points for the bumper, I want to add something in that's just going to hold everything in the right place and make all the panel gaps much nicer. And the way we're going to do that is really simple. On this gap here, it's a double skin, so we can easily install a plate, which goes from here here to here with some screws in between which is going to hold everything in shape. After that we've got to finish modifying the arch lines to get those to fit and then it's the new wheels, get it on the floor and see the final finished result. To do this we just use this small metal plate with these four screw holes and drill one hole in place, got a screw into it and then use the rest of the holes to pilot the other ones. Okay, so now the front bumper is secured thanks to those plates and screws and the panel gap is looking pristine. We need to get an arch liner in there. Now what I've done with this is I've stuck with the factory one and cut these fingers in it. So now what we can do with these is tuck them behind the fiberglass for the body kit and it should fit well, hopefully. Now I'm sure there's plenty of ways of doing this. I had someone mention about using a couple of arch liners, but this is just the method I chose. And it's probably not the perfect one because there is still gonna be very small gaps in between those fingers, but it will definitely do the job and it's much better than not running one at all. 
Now there was one or two bits which just poked out a little bit too much so we used a bit of heat then just to reshape that section and it seemed to work a lot better and stay in place. And I also found by heating it all up a tiny bit it definitely did help it remember its shape a lot better too. And the rears didn't take too much work but they again just tucks behind the fiberglass. It's been a long week, the car is now there, we've got the arch liners in, we've got the kit fitted, we've got everything painted, it's not been easy. But there is now one crucial piece missing which is going to transform this car and it's the wheels. This is going to be the thing that makes or breaks this body kit. Let's see what you think. So these are Rotiform KB1s. The KB stands for Ken Block, who I'm sure we've all heard of, but if you haven't, I'm gonna give you a very quick recap on an automotive legend. Ken Block was originally the founder of DC Shoes, which is a skating footwear company. Once selling his shares in that, he then focused his attention into Hoonigan Industries. And this is where probably most of us know him from. He has been making legendary videos, performing stunts that are beyond belief, for years now. And this Jim Carla series over its 10 episodes has collected over a billion views. A billion. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about his motorsport achievements because if I did, I wouldn't be able to scratch the surface. But unfortunately, Ken lost his life earlier in this year in a snowmobile accident, which was a tragic loss for everyone in the motorsport world. But it's safe to say Ken Block secured himself as an icon within the motoring industry. And with this, he designed and released his own sets of wheels, which he designed for his own cars he used in the Jim Carner videos for sale to the public. More typically adopted by the Ford fans, seeing as this is what Ken mainly drove in his videos, but I think these wheels would be the perfect style and fit for my Hyundai i30N. So that is precisely the reason why I've chose these wheels, and plus I think they're gonna accent the car perfectly and fit the style of the car perfectly too. And just quickly, if you're wondering about the tires, I've gone for Continental Sport Contact 7s. And the reason why I've chose these is because of Ben from Evil GT. He gave me a lecture about why these are so much better than my go-to tire, the Michelin Pilot Sport 4S, so I thought I'd take his word on it and give these a try. There's only one way to find out, let's get them on. So we carefully fitted up the wheels, tyres, spigot rings and new nuts that I got from Wheelmania. And we can finally take a step back and look at what all of this work has achieved. This body kit is very Marmite, you love it or you hate it, so some of you in the comments are going to think the whole car looks ridiculous anyway. But for me, this body kit has absolutely made this car, but the thing that's ruined it at the moment is this, the fitment. Or should I say, the lack of. The way the wheels are sitting in the arch is stupid. But I was fully aware that this would be the case when I bought these wheels. But nevertheless, I still need to do something about it. So I think it's pretty obvious what I need to do. And that is fit these. These are called wheel spacers, which do exactly what they say on the tin. They push the wheel further out of the arch, which is going to be essential to make these wheels look like they fit with this body kit. So these go on the hubs just here, like that. They bolt in to these ones, and your wheel then bolts on to these here. And I got these, along with the wheels themselves, from the guys at Wheel Mania. So all you have to do to fit these is remove the wheel, bolt the wheel spacer in place of the wheel, and then bolt the wheel onto the wheel spacer. It couldn't get much easier. So size wise, we went 20 millimeters out on the front and 35 mil out on the rear. Now I'm sure some of you are thinking, are these safe? Well, in my experience, the answer is yes. I've run them on loads of cars in the past to bring the wheels further out into the arch, whether it be wide body or non-wide body, and I've never had a problem. But I think it is only right we make sure they're safe by putting them through the paces in this video. 
So we can get the Rotiform KB1s bolted back up to the car and see how much better they're going to be fitting with those wheel spaces in place. Spacers now fitted and how much better is the fitment looking out on the front and on the back. Maybe I could have gone out a tiny little bit more on the back but I'm pretty happy with it. I am toying with the idea of not actually lowering it because well the kind of theme and look of this car I feel just screams rally car and then absolutely decking it is not going to give that the same vibe. But there is a second reason too. And that is because of this front splitter here. Just pulling off my driveway the other day I managed to catch it and absolutely annihilate it here, here, here. It's got kind of stress fractures all through it as well now so that needs repairing and if I lower the car it's just going to make that worse. But nothing set in stone on that front so you know things could change. And because that splitter was born to never survive I've had to remove it from the car so this is the look we're going to go with for now. It's rally car vibes so I don't mind it. So now it's time to see if this Hyundai can really stand up to British roads and everything that's going to throw at them, especially now we've fitted these wheel spaces and the wide body kit because I'm sure some of you are going to have questions as to whether they're going to be durable or not and there is only one man which is up for the job of that but unfortunately Whistling Diesel's busy so we're <laughs> stuck with Mark and his, and his kebab. <laughs> so this is Mark McCann, petrol head, family man, entrepreneur and just generally an all-round nice guy. And if you ask me, he deserves the award for best smile on YouTube. But I can't go without saying this guy is completely nuts. According to his Google profile, Mark is a Christian author, but I'm not sure how true that is, but what I do know is he has one of the most varied and vast car collections I've ever seen. Right, I'm currently sat in one of Mark's cars, an Audi A6, and in return for him reviewing my car, I'm going to do him a little favour by fixing a few little things which annoy him on his. And to do that, I'm going to be using OBD11, which couldn't be much easier to use. All you're going to do, get it out of the box, then plug it into the OBD port, turn on the ignition, and then fire up the OBD11 app. And then once obd 11s detected what sort of car it is, we can then look at what we can do to it. The first thing that we can do is a diagnostic report, so let's do that quickly. So there's 25 different modules to scan, let's see how many faults we get. So here we go, a total of seven faults found on Mark's car, that's not great. So two faults on the engine, one's for the math sensor, and one for the cam sensor. There's one for the AC clutch, one for a headlight bulb, two codes showing for the fuel filler flap, and one for the parcel shelf. Now I'm going to do Mark a solid and clear all of these codes for him. Some mechanics would charge over £100 for what I've just done. There. Now using OBD11 you can also turn on hidden features on your car that the dealership didn't want you to have. You can make it so your rear lights go on all the time as a DRL and you can also set it so the start stop is automatically off when you get in the car. And also a really popular one on these is the needle sweep. So when you start the car the rev counter and the speedo go all the way to the top and back to the bottom. So in short there's loads that you can do with OBD11 to your van group car or BMW from E series to I series from diagnostics to coding as well. So to cheat your main dealer and also your mechanic which is charging you too much for diagnostics, grab yourself an OBD11 device using my link in the description and discount code SLICKS. But now we've sorted Mark's car out, let's see what he thinks to mine. So it's clear that Mark knows his way around a good car, so I think it's time to see whether the Hyundai ticks all of those boxes. First impressions, Mark? Looks is a good, well, we're we'll going nine. It looks amazing, love the white wheels. You know when you said about looks then, were you talking about me or a car? You. <laughs> How big are the wheel spaces? So you've got 20 mil on the front and 35 mil on the rear. Is that the same as what you've got on the SBJ? <laughs> it's weird they don't put wheel spaces on the standard, isn't it? I know, yeah, <laughs> so strange. <laughs> there might be a reason. What do you think of the interior? It's a nice looking car. I like the seats. Yeah, seats are comfy. She sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she is now. <laughs> it wasn't before, but now it is. But yeah, I've got 10 minutes until I've got to run off. So if you take out on a road test, go down a country lane, maybe go through a puddle, and I want to know your opinion of the car. It's got to be an extreme test. Extreme puddle. Yeah, it's an extreme puddle. <laughs> extreme big road. Please, yeah, just definitely, please, for me, don't go up the track. You definitely said take it up the track. Don't go up the track. What's the point of bringing it up here if we don't go up the track? I said not the track! She's quite low, isn't she? <laughs> This isn't going to last long. A test. Adult mode. Right, let's go. I can't believe this. I can hear him already. He's a lunatic. Mark! Mark! Give me my car back. This is a pain. Give me it back now. <laughs> I can't 
believe this. He's ruining me car. Admit, this has actually looked like quite a lot of fun. I want in. <laughs> Let me in. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> Go on, That is one thing I wish Mark never said because really we were here to durability to test those wheel spaces and the only way to do it is on his jump. Please don't break my car. That's a trouble in Mark. Eh? I can do the bumper. It's when it comes down to land. Isn't yeah, it? it's if it nose dives, isn't it? Yeah. What else have you jumped here? The Yaris Mini. Do they all survive? Yeah, yeah. Let's do it then. We're doing it. <laughs> Let's do it. Ready? No. Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> I think the bump is still on. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do the damage. Oh my god. <laughs> I think we're right till then. What have we done? <laughs> <laughs> that was we just so need, good. We just needed more speed. <laughs> Did it get, even get air? Yeah, it definitely jumped. Okay. We definitely had four wheels off the ground. <laughs> How bad is it? Is it alive? We can do it with like a front diffuser again. <laughs> Oh, let's see how much damage we've done. <laughs> okay, maybe it wasn't quite as epic as Mark's jump, but air is air, and that is officially a jump in the I-30N. Oh, that ain't too bad. That should clip back in. <laughs> it's dirty, maybe. I thought. Oh, no. That clip back in. Have you got a jet wash? No. Oh. <laughs> we just need more speed. <laughs> Ah. Right, straight on the raffle side. 99 pence a ticket. Oh, it's gone, is it? Yeah, it's dug in there. <laughs> but That's still a fair jump. <laughs> <laughs> All right, please. back in. Um, well, I think it might, but I think it needs replacing. You're going to get another three episodes out of this now. <laughs> yeah. You're saying like it's mine. My... <laughs> <laughs> it definitely looks better dirty. You <laughs> could wrap this now, PPF it on top. I could. <laughs> I think that'd look good. But one thing I do want to know is <laughs> does it have its rally pedigree? It's brilliant. <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant. If it was rear wheel drive, that would be immense. That'd be not. one way to make it better. Hyundai, listen, make a rear wheel drive version and you'd buy it. Or four wheel drive, but not yeah, front yeah. wheel drive. That's the only thing I think that lets it down. Yeah. But we still had a good time. It sounds amazing, it looks amazing, you're amazing. So are you. Well, thank you for bringing it here. Mark, love you. Thank you. I need to go fix my car now, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> So with the Hyundai now wearing inches of mud and battle scars from Mark's field, we really need to get this car cleaned up. But I think it's only right that we do one final job on this car to give it its final send off. So I think it's pretty safe to say we need to clean this up. It's definitely not a job that I want to do at home. Mm. <laughs> 
So to clean it, I took it to a local car wash near me and used the bay where all of the off-roaders use, so to make sure all the mud's not going to really bother anyone. And I must have spent about £30 on the jet wash to make sure to get most of the mud out anyway of all of the nooks and crannies and the arches and all that sort of stuff, because trust me, it got everywhere. But was it worth it taking it to Mark's house and putting the car through all of this just to have a bit of fun? The answer is absolutely yes. It's going to be one of those things I remember for a lifetime. So now I've got most of the mud jet washed out of the car and all the underbody. There was a lot, I promise you, and it's not been a quick job. But I've come down to Ultimate Customs where we have finished off the final clean. And now we can start looking at the next step because there's one thing which all rally cars need. I know I'm not talking about mud flaps. We're going to be putting a livery on this car, kind of a race inspired decal set to really set off the look of the i30N, the wide body, and also to make this car look a little bit more mental. Now, I realise this car is no rally car. I get that. It is a bit of fun, but I want to do something which is going to set it off, make it look a little bit more wild, because that's one thing which, even though I love the style of this kit, I think it could look a little bit more crazy and stand out a bit more. So the question is, what do we do? Well, I have no experience in designing a livery or anything like that, so I gave the job to my mate Matt Jones, who set about doing something to tie up this whole project. And I don't think it was an easy job particularly for him either, because what I had to do was quite complicated. Putting a 2D drawing onto a 3D object is never going to be easy. But once he was happy with it, we got it on the computer with the guys at Ultimate Customs in Warrington, and then set about how we were going to actually put this on the car. Now I'm certain I want to use a red because it ties in with the calipers, it ties in with the trims on the bumpers and some of the bits on the interior, so that's a definite. I think something that will go quite well with that is like a contrast but also it will work with it is like a satin silver, so I think... Let's go have a look at that on the car actually. So for this bit I could either try and tie in with the wheels and go for a white, but I kind of like the contrast from the wheels and I think the silver looks quite sleek, I like it being satin. Let's go silver. And then the final colour of the three, we've gone for this kind of satin dark blue, which I think is really, really nice. So that is going to be the trio of colours that we're going to use on the i30N, in addition to the light blue paintwork. So we decided to start with the most complicated shape on the side of the car, which is the N for the N logo, which is going to be quite big, and we're going to do it in this satin blue. So Ryan at Ultimate Customs cut it out on his plotter, then we could peel away the excess and then turn it into a sticker, which we can transfer onto the car. And once we'd found the perfect position for this, we could tear off the backing and get it on. Now it's time for the first piece. So we use magnets to position it where we wanted it and then we can tear away half of the backing, get that applied and then use that to then position the rest of it. Now that's on, we can peel away the paper and reveal the final product. All that's left to do is post heat the edges and get them all stuck down and then it's on to the next bit. And I really wanted to have a go at this. As we've seen before on the channel, I've wrapped a couple of cars myself but this was done to a much higher standard and I really felt the pressure doing it, but I wanted to get at least one bit done on my own. And I was definitely feeling a bit rusty doing this because I haven't wrapped a car since my Audi TT at the start of the year. But with a bit of guidance from Ryan, I got this on and got it all leveled up nicely and then we can move on to the next stripe, which was the silver one. But even though it's in the early stages, we had a familiar face pop by to give an opinion or two. Hey, it's looking well, isn't it? It's like Colgate, isn't it? Yeah. Colgate stripes. Is he actually helping you or is he... Um, Just put that red stripe on. Oh, brilliant. Okay, the easiest <laughs> bit, literally. <laughs> hate is going to hate, man. What did you do? Cool. What do you reckon? That looks good, that mate. That's a bit of me. Yeah. However, I feel like you're lying, but go these, for it. No. Okay. Are these just going to stick up like that? I'm assuming they're going to wrap around the car properly. Yeah. <laughs> they're not made out of cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was wondering. So from what we've got downstairs, yeah, we've got the red one on, we've got the blue one on, we've got the N on, but we have the red accents here and here. Yeah. There's going to be something across here and down here as well. The red stripe, a silver stripe. Okay. And then I'm going to have Uncle Benji really yes. across the windows. Yeah. I want it across your back window. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I know that you promised Ultimate Customs that you were going to get involved with this, and so far you've put a bit of the red stripe on. No, so I did the whole red stripe. Oh, did you? Yeah, I did the whole one. You're going to pull your finger out. I can hold that for you if you want, and you can crack Let's on. do that. <laughs> <laughs> so with Ben from Evil GT manning the camera, I got a bit more stuck in and started doing some of the pinstriping on the diffuser, because little details like this are really going to make a difference to the overall look of the car. 
and another one was the center slat on the front grille too. And while I was doing these easy little bits, Ryan was tackling the much more difficult silver stripe. This was one of the most complicated ones because it went over like three different surfaces at different angles. The most challenging part of this, like I already said, is making a 2D drawing essentially on a 3D object look correct because you couldn't just use one straight piece of vinyl on this because it would throw all of the angles out. Oh no, you digging a flow. And now it's back to me, I'm freestyling a little bit on the boot because we hadn't really got much design for the back but we wanted something on there. So I went for the tricolour stripes which we've used already, just in a smaller form across one side of the back lights. Okay, so we're onto the passenger side but this has had its complications because on this side, this is the side which was originally designed, you can see which way the letter N faces and how that works with the stripes and the logo. So we've had to do a bit of tweaking to make it work on the other side because if we just directly mirrored it then the N would be back to front and it just looked really really strange so we've had to shift the N around but keep the stripes in the same place and I think it's still going to look alright. So while Ryan got this side laid down like an absolute pro I finished off on the boot lid with that blue stripe. To make sure the gaps in between each of the stripes are completely uniform we use different size tapes to make sure that the gap is consistent all the way down. The wrong number. Shows overseas, they got love for me, but best believe I'm touring Belize just for me. Oh. And then again, I started doing some freestyling bits on the front end because the original design only had two small little red stripes on the bonnet, and I wasn't 100% loving that, but I wasn't 100% happy with this either. The look I thought what I did gave it made it look like a wedding car, which was definitely not what I was after. So we can revisit that in a second once we've put the finishing details on the sides. There wasn't many, just a few little red accents to set off the look of the body kit. Okay, so we are making some progress and we've got most of the car finished, but there's one bit that we want to revisit. And that is the bonnet. We're both agreeing that it doesn't quite look right with the rest of the car. It's, it just doesn't suit it. Something's not right and we need to do something, but we're not 100% sure what yet. So we're going to start by wrapping the front section of this bumper blue and then going from there and trying to work towards something which ties in better with the back end. And this was the bit that I found the most challenging because it was so hard to decide what's actually going to look good on the front of the car. Now, I've seen on a lot of the race cars and the ring taxis that they had something over this front section here. I'd presume partially because it protects the paint, but it definitely does give something to the front end of the car as well. And then we pulled out the whiteboard pens and started drawing up a few different ideas to try and gauge what was going to work on the front end of the Hyundai. Right, we're just arguing about what the best solution is going to be for this and I think we've found what we're going to give a go and hopefully this time it's going to work. So we've got two blue stripes going here and here, solid thick ones in straight lines rather than curved ones like this and then using red accents up it similar to what we've done here to accent it, tie it in with the rest of the car a little bit better and still hopefully bring enough colour and enough going onto the front end and probably also put a logo in. I'm undecided whether we're going to remove these or not because once those are on they might look okay but if they don't then they can come off and then is there anything else? No. <laughs> There'll probably be something else, you're right. So that's the plan at the moment. My idea, I'll just show you quickly, was going up kind of in this centre shape area here with shapes like this, like that, and then that sort of growing bigger the higher up the bonnet it got, but uh, you reckon it like a Wi-Fi logo, so <laughs> that shut that one down. So let's give this a go. I'm really hoping this time it works. It's starting to get late. So here we go applying the version 2 of the front end. Now I don't want to hear it if you think I should have done this or that in the comments section. What I'm actually going to do, because I know loads of people are going to have an opinion on this, is leave a blank version of the front end of this car in a download on the description. And if you've got a better idea, I want you to draw it on there and if I do end up doing it, I'm going to send you 200 quid. But before we finish up at Ultimate Customs, I've got to say a massive thank you to Ryan. If you do need anything like this or any wrapping work or PPF, he's based in Warrington. If you're interested in getting in touch with him i'm going to leave all his details in the description but then we just had the final finishing touches to do we were going to put the n logo on the bonnet and also some red accents on the blue stripes but again this wasn't plain sailing we decided we went too far with all the red accents and decided to minimize that before finishing off the bonnet by putting some color inside that n logo Here we go, the final piece is done. One word, how do you feel? Up is done. <laughs> that was three words. <laughs> well, the time now is just gone midnight. I've got a two hour drive home, so I'm probably gonna do that right now, and I'm gonna show you guys this car in the morning.
have it, that marks the end of the Hyundai i30M build. Now I know some of you are gonna love this look and some of you are gonna hate it, but at the end of the day, all it is is a set of stickers that you can peel off and take it straight back to the original factory, well, wide body look anyway, at no hassle at all. Now there is still a couple of little bits I need to do after this. I need to get the red trim back on the front. I did order one, but Hyundai sent a black one instead of a red one, so I've gotta wait for that to come before I can put that on. And I think we're gonna put the front splitter back on and hopefully this time I can keep it in one piece. Now this car is gonna be for sale at some point in the very near future, so I'm gonna leave a link for my Instagram in the description where I'm gonna do a full advert with everything that's been done to it and how much exactly I want for it. So if you're interested, go pop me a follow down there. But I really hope you guys have enjoyed watching this build as much as I have doing it, and we're definitely gonna have some more in the very near future. So if you've enjoyed this video and the whole Hyundai series, make sure you subscribe if you're not already. Make sure to hit that like button, and I'll catch you next time.